Good evening. This is Chairwoman Makita Scott. I now call to order the meeting of the Board of Education of Baltimore County for Tuesday, September 28th, 2021. I invite you to recite the Pledge of Allegiance to the flag to be led by Mr. Thomas. We will then have a moment of silence and recognition of those who have served education in Baltimore County. I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the republic for which it stands, one nation under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. Thank you, Mr. Thomas. Tonight's Board of Education meeting is being held both in person and by phone by board members and streamed online through Microsoft Teams and broadcasted through BCPS TV, Comcast Xfinity Channel 73, Verizon Files Channel 34. In order to efficiently conduct this meeting, all voting items this evening will be done by a roll call vote. The first item on the agenda is the consideration of the September 28th agenda. Dr. Williams, are there any additions or changes to tonight's agenda? I think we have one change. Ms. Uh, board Member Joes. Uh, Ms. Pastor, I'd like to add um, a motion or the acceptance for our handbook, the board handbook to the agenda, please. Is there a second? Second, Offerman. Thank you. Thank you. Ms. Gover, may we do a roll call vote, please, to add the handbook to the agenda? I would like to amend it to add it after um, item G. G. I apologize. Yes, it should be after item G. Oh, okay, so the motion is to um, add the handbook to the agenda after item G. Yes, that's correct. Okay, and it was seconded by Mr. Offerman. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Thank you, Ms. Jones. Yes. Ms. Yes. Ms. Mack? Yes. 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 Ms. Yes. Yes. Mr. Yes. Mr. Yes. 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 Thank you. Okay, the revised agenda is approved. Thank you. Earlier this evening, the board met in closed session pursuant to the Open Meetings Act for the following reasons. To one, discuss the appointment, employment, assignment, promotion, discipline, demotion, compensation, removal, resignation, or performance evaluation of appointees, employees, or officials over whom it has jurisdiction, or any other personnel matter that affects one or more specific individuals. And nine, conduct collective bargaining negotiations or consider matters that relate to the negotiations. The minutes of the closed session and informal summary can be found on board docs under this board meeting agenda date. The next item on the agenda is personnel matters and for that I call on Ms. Anderson. Good evening, Chairwoman Scott, Vice Chairwoman Hen, Superintendent Williams, and members of the board. I would like the board's consent for the following personnel matters. Terminations rescinded. Any questions? No. Retirements. Any questions? No. Please proceed. Resignations. Any questions? No. Thank you. Thank you. Do I have a motion to approve the personnel matters as presented in exhibits D1 through D3? So moved, Mac. Second, I, second Offerman. Thank you. Is there any discussion? May I have a roll call vote, please? Ms. Yes. Ms. Yes. Ms. Mack? Yes. Ms. McWilliams? Yes. Ms. Jones? Yes. Ms. Jones? 
Yes. 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 Thank you. The next item on the agenda is administrative appointments, and for that, I call on Dr. Williams. Madam Chair and members of the board, I am bringing forward the following administrative appointments for your approval. Our Director, of the Office of Food and Nutrition Services, and the Supervisor, Office of Position Management and Classification. <laughs> Let me continue. Our first appointee is David J. Indraki. As the supervisor in the Office of Position Management and Classification, he brings to us four years of service in Baltimore County. Previously, he was the fiscal analyst three in the Office of Budget and Reporting, and his previous experience, he worked at MedStar Health for three years, Johns Hopkins Bayview Medical Center for three years. Congratulations, Mr. Indraki. <laughs> the next appointment is Jamie Hetzler, the Director of Office of Food and Nutrition Services. Welcome to BCPS. Uh, she served as the Senior Food and Beverage Director, Leg Mason Tower Restaurant Associates Compass Group. She also served as the Food and Beverage Director in the Smithsonian Castle, as well as the Acting Director in the National Portrait Gallery. We welcome you, Jamie Gessler. Hetzler, pardon me. Congratulations. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Williams. Do I have a motion to approve the administrative appointments as presented in Exhibit E1? So moved, Thomas. Do I have a second? Second, Causey. Any discussion? No. May I have a roll call vote, please? Ms. Rose? Yes. Ms. Bobby? Yes. Ms. Mack? Yes. Ms. Yes. Yes. Ms. Yes. Mr. Thomas? Yes. Mr. Yes. 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 Thank you. Our next item is public comment. This is one, one of the opportunities the board provides to hear the views and receive the advice of community members. The members of the board appreciate hearing from interested citizens. As appropriate, we will refer your concerns to the superintendent for follow-up by his staff. The Board of Education will conduct the public comment portion of the meeting by allowing those who registered to speak to attend in person. Registration was open to the public one week prior to tonight's board meeting and was closed at 3 p.m. yesterday for anyone wishing to speak at this evening's meeting. Board practice limits to 10, the number of speakers at a regularly scheduled board meeting. Speakers were selected randomly using an electronic selection process from all registrations received within the designated time frame. Each speaker is allowed three minutes to address the board. Of course, if fewer than 10 registrations are received, all who registered will be permitted to speak. However, no speaker substitutions will be allowed. While we encourage public input on policy programs and practices within the purview of this board and this school system, this is not the proper forum to address specific student or employee matters or to comment on matters that do not relate to public education in Baltimore County. We encourage everyone to utilize existing dispute resolution processes as appropriate. I remind everyone that inappropriate personal remarks or other behavior that disrupts or interferes with the conduct of this meeting are out of order. I ask speakers to observe the three minute clock, which will let you know when your time is up. Please conclude your remarks when you hear the tone or see that time has expired. The microphone will be turned off at the end of your time and it could be turned off if a speaker addresses specific student or employee matters or is commenting on matters not related to public education in Baltimore County. If not selected, the public may submit their comments to the board 
to the board members via email at boe at bcps.org. More information is provided on the board's website at bcps.org under Board of Education, Participation by the Public. So it is the practice of this board to allow elected officials to provide their comments to the board. So first to speak is... So it looks like our stakeholder groups. Um, from our stakeholder group is Beverly Folkoff. Thank you. Good evening. My name is Beverly Folkoff. I'm a self-contained special education teacher at Relay Elementary School. I'm a member of the TABCO Board of Directors, and on behalf of TABCO, I have two important topics to discuss tonight. First, we stand with ESPBC, supporting their needs for increased wages, no furloughs, and no layoffs. Staff shortages in the ESPBC unit affect us all. BCPS, take the strong step to fill the vacancies. Pay a living wage, and let's support people do what they do best. Support our students and our educators. Second, I speak for a specialized subset of our TABCO members, the helpers. School counselors serve as an integral role in supporting students, families, and entire school communities. You will see them with smiles on their faces as they give their all to students. They are all in for all students, but they are spread too thin. The immense needs of students and counselors' natural inclination to go above and beyond to help others has created an unsustainable workload. A recent TABCO survey of school counselors indicated that over 40% were unable to take a duty-free lunch, over 80% were unable to use their allotted planning time, and over one-third spent over one hour of their day doing assigned non-counseling duties. Less than 4% of school counselors are operating within the recommended ratio of 250 students per counselor, most having between 300 and 400 students on their caseload. The ask from our school counselors is simple. They want to be able to help students, to have time and resources, to spend their days providing students with direct counseling services, to build resilience and cope with trauma, plan for the future, and to help recognize individual strengths and gifts. Inefficiencies in the system, confusion around school counselors' roles, and delegation of non-counseling tasks has led to school counselors being tasked with taking responsibilities well outside the scope of their role. The American School Counselor Association clearly outlines the tasks that are appropriate and inappropriate duties for school counselors. However, despite the efforts from the Office of School Counseling, the Department of Student Support Services, and the Division of School Climate and Safety, our counselors are being constantly forced to take on a range of responsibilities that pulls them away from kids. After the last two years, our students need social and emotional support more than ever. Our school counselors are trained, prepared, and overwhelmingly eager to provide the support. Dr. Williams, the message needs to be clear. School counselors counsel students. They should not be covering classes, handling student discipline, acting as data entry clerks, or serving as liaisons. This is the perfect time to model your commitment to ensuring that our students have the support they need. Help our helpers help our kids. Our kids are too important. Thank you very much. Thank you. Our next speaker is Mr. Bash Ferrone. Good evening. I am Dr. Ferron, the chair of the Central Area Educational Council. The Central Area Educational Council had a productive, informative meeting on 9-22-2021. Two experienced members of administration presented the topic of retain and recruit teachers. Ms. Joelle Bilski, and Ms. Deborah Piper presented the challenges facing recruitment and retention. Both speakers were informative 
and engaging. About 24 persons attended the meeting. The central area really truly appreciate the significance, the significance of what the staff doing in relation to recruitment and retention. It seems to be more support from the board and administration to this area uh, is appropriate. Our next meeting is in October 6. Central area will be hosting a meeting open to everyone in relation to the budget. Our member, Manny Hanson, who is a financial advisor, is assessing my school box program as there seems to be a room for improvement. Now, Manny and I like to explore, with your help, the BCPS Foundation Chair to how we, the school system, can gain more funds through the foundation, just like hospitals do. Hospitals get millions and millions of funds privately. Our member, Ms. Leanne Dickens, is working on improving the communication of the central area. The difficulty is we have no access to parents or teachers' emails, cell phones, so we have really difficulty in communicating in our area. Last but not least, the central area requests the Board of Education and administration to buy in into our request that we teach the G7 languages and Chinese, Arabic, Farsi, and Urdu. Furthermore, the stakeholders would like the school system to address and get rid of the system from any form of bias or hate against minorities. We asked you in the past, I think my time is up. I send it to you by email, two thoughts at the end. Thank you. Next we have Samantha Warfell. Good evening, my name is Samantha Warfell, and this year I have the honor of serving my second term as the Baltimore County Student Council's president. And since we have last shared our updates with you all, we've been hard at work collaborating, team building, and planning collectively with our new executive board as we gear up for our first committee meetings on October 4th, including our environmental committee, our diversity and equity committee, our committee on awareness of the role of the student member of the board, our infrastructure committee, and our Student Services Committee. We look forward to and have begun to diligently plan for our virtual fall leadership camp, for which we cannot wait to share the exciting and very fitting theme that will be apparent throughout our workshops and activities. Presently, we stand with our fellow students across the county as we take the challenges of the new school year in stride with empathy and resilience. We share our ideas and innovations as we craft COVID safe plans for fall high school activities like pep rallies and events in lieu of homecomings. To our leadership, we thank you for your concern for our safety as we strive to rebuild our school communities and spirits that were once typical in a typical year. And to students who may be watching tonight, we applaud and support you as you work with unwavering grit to make these things happen safely and with respect to county guidelines. We also recognize that pep rallies and homecomings, while integral in cultivating our communities, are not the only issues that face us presently. As a student council body, we aim to advocate alongside our peers as we encounter issues such as the maintenance of safety protocols in our schools, especially in areas where risk of COVID-19 is exacerbated, such as in lunchrooms and at athletics events. We also strive to bring attention to issues that have resulted from our current circumstances such as the significant environmental implications of single-use materials and unused food products. 
Where do unopened food items go? How can we advocate to maximize their use? These are questions that we have. This year, we move forward with our past environmental resolution, complete with several action items with which we hope to expand upon with ideas such as these. And we have many more questions, thoughts, and ideas on widely ranging topics when it comes to the issues that press our students countywide. We cannot wait to share them with you and make our presence be known in this boardroom throughout the year. I thank you tremendously for your time tonight on behalf of BCSC and the students in Baltimore County. And I hope that you all have a great rest of your evening. Thank you. Thank you. Now we have general public comment and our first speaker is Lena Amick. and thank you for having me. My name is Lena Amick. Um, I'm a teacher at Owings Mills High School. And I'm here speaking for the BCPS educators who are too exhausted from the 10 plus hours of work a day and too burnt out to be here. For those of us who are at second jobs to make ends meet because we're not sufficiently compensated. For those new teachers, like my coworker in my department who still don't know how and when they're gonna get paid because there's less than 10 support professionals in offices designed to serve over a thousand teachers. At our school this year, as you know, we have a full staffing crisis that is only going to get worse unless we have full institutional support from this board. Look at our resignation lists. At Woodlawn High School, um, my colleagues are short five teachers and on Friday, 18 teachers called out. What happens when this happens? Teachers get pulled from precious planning time. ESPs gets pulled from classes and students with IEPs or emotional and behavioral needs are left with inadequate support. Without our ESPs, we would not be in compliance with our IEPs. Or like my school, students are corralled into a lecture hall for a free period without instruction that they need because we simply do not have enough staff that can support them as well as do testing, as well as um, give our students the support they need in classes. And our teachers aren't just out because they're tired, it's a pandemic. Right? There's crises that I'm sure in your lives, you can think of yourselves, you can think of people you know who are facing crises in your lives. My coworkers and I are the same way. We are facing crises and we need support, not just words of self-care, not just ideas of how we can take care of ourselves. I work 10, 11, 12 hours a day to support my students. I need to make sure that there are gonna be people there in my building, in the central office, that are gonna support me to deliver the instruction that my students need and the emotional support that they need in, um, in our schools. And let me be clear, there should be no either or choice between paying teachers and paying ESPs. Budgeting is about priorities. What about my hardworking core, what my hardworking coworkers, our ESPs, have heard um, from our board and the decisions that uh, BCPS has made is that you don't prioritize them. They don't even know, they don't even know if they're gonna be furloughed or laid off next year in a pandemic. And so if we're not spending our public budget on our most precious and necessary resources, our staff, then what are we spending it on? Um, and I will just end by saying I'm a fifth year teacher. This is my fifth year of teaching. This is a profession that I invested time into, that I truly love, that I'm good at, that I wanna keep doing. I dedicate so much to my students and I dedicate, um, I've dedicated my life to this profession. And I'm really scared that I'm not gonna be able to stay in it. And whether or not I stay in this profession is fully dependent on whether I have the support in my school of other staff and the time that I need to do it so that I don't have to donate my hours outside of school and not spend time doing things like caring for my family and my friends who are in crisis. Thank you. Our next speaker is Ms. Diana, Diana Bergman. Good evening, everybody. So I wanna put this out on the record today. In 2014, I was supporting staff for BCPS as a Spanish interpreter for the World Language Department. I flew in last week from California, the teacher shortage, staff shortage for our educators. That shortage is very severe across the nation. 
I've witnessed being told that your child cannot start school until we could hire a one-on-one aide to be compliant with the IEP. That school district is really, really challenged right now in California. And I'm here to say that when I came to visit to try to resolve some issues um, regarding transcripts to make sure they were correct for my children, it was hard to get a hold of someone. I couldn't understand why people weren't picking up the phone. I actually came to visit Greenwood and I got to see the inside of the mansion with the beautiful artwork done by our teachers, which I've always enjoyed. But I saw sadness in our school system. I went to one of my children's former school. Sadness exhausts, like people are just exhausted and drained in our system. People that I know love children. They're there for children. So I'm here to tell you, every single one of you, turn your listening ears on. Turn them on. Put the foolishness and the pettiness aside. Prioritize our children, our students. That's why you're here. <coughs> Prioritize our educators. They need support. They're very short staffed. You guys have to all figure out how to work together. You should be focused on solutions. All the other day-to-day back and forth policy, focus right now on solutions. How to keep those that love teaching our children and supporting our children here so they could access an education. Because that's what we wake up every day. Every day we wake up and we want to make sure we're doing the best we can from the day before for our students in education. And we got to figure out how to work together and find supports for our one-on-one aides so we could be able to implement IEPs, find supports for our teachers, all the way up to central staff because they're struggling there too. I can see they're just tired. And a lot of people are starting to be tired of being tired in education. So let's focus on what means the world to us, which is our children and their education experience. At some point that's gonna trickle down to them. We don't want that to happen. Thank you, and I love you guys in BCPS. I can't wait to come back in a little bit. But I've always loved BCPS and everybody here, regardless of what challenges are thrown ahead of us. Thank you. Next, we have Phoebe Evans Latosha. Good evening. My name is Phoebe Evans Latosha. I'm a historian, archivist, a county executive appointed commissioner on the Baltimore County Landmarks Preservation Commission, a Stone Lake Community Association board member and delegate to the Towson Communities Alliance. I come before you not as a representative of those institutions, but as a private citizen and parent of two children, a current Towson High student and the other a graduate. My understanding of historic preservation based on my own experience on the LPC and in consultation with former commissioner and staff is that there is no mechanism to delist or remove a landmark property that was validly listed. The original grounds for listing Towson High as a landmark still apply and remain relevant. The county and school system raised no objection to listing Towson High in 2006, nor was there controversy surrounding that designation. The building can be honored, can be altered, but there is, are no grounds to remove it from the landmarks list. Any exterior changes to a, the landmark building would go before the LPC. Those changes could include requests to replace elements of the building that are beyond repair and non-functional, to put on additions to historic structures, to remove non-contributing structures such as the 1953 and 1965 Towson High additions. The LPC would need to see actual design plans for the Towson High building, which BCPS does not yet have. Planning and design is the next step that needs to happen. I see no reason why Towson High can't remain listed as a replacement school on the CIP for planning purposes so that BCPS can begin the process of planning to design a school that both rebuilds Towson High with a new gym, cafeteria, and other common spaces, addresses overcrowding, and retains distinctive architectural elements of the landmark 1949 building, such as its stone massing, the Cedar Avenue entrance with its tower and distinctive art modern features, and the auditorium entrance with this mural depiction of the arts on the exterior wall. The building can be rehabilitated by replacing systems and features that no longer serve the needs of 21st century students and by retaining historical architectural elements that do contribute to the building's landmark status. I was dismayed 
that the three options presented in the executive summary of the GWWO feasibility study made no mention of the school's landmark status. None of the options presented involved designing either a replacement or renovation addition where the students were moved off site so that a rebuild could be designed with the landmark designation in mind. An interior replacement and addition could incorporate the landmark exterior features that contribute toward its designation. All the feasibility study showed was that the three options presented would be expensive, ranging from 131 to 143 million. However, none of them are feasible. Further delaying the planning process with political games arguing over a replacement versus renovation addition, short changes Towson students and the community, which has already put up with trailers for 17 years. Towson previously experienced an underfunded renovation completed in 1999, which we don't want to see repeated. With greater transparency and community engagement, I'm hopeful that a consensus building. Thank you. Next is Mr. Basharon. So today I'd like to talk to you about equality, equal. The proposed calendar 22-23 is a good effort of the members of the calendar committee. However, there are at least four deficiencies. One, there is no objective proof that pre-labor start is better for student education and the last appearance of Mr. Duke before you. He reported that some prefer pre-labor start for athletic reasons. I requested Mr. Duke to present objective evidence for or against pre-labor start. I have not really heard or received any evaluation. I have more than 20 years experience in the calendar committee. The calendar committee should design the calendar to further the student education and not grant preferences to the few. I recommend starting the school always post labor for consistency. Number two, the proposed calendar does not treat the Muslim holidays equal to the other minority. This is a violation of what the PRC and the Board of Education has agreed to by unanimous vote in the past. Equal must mean equal. One equals one. Two equals two. Zero equals zero. This proposed calendar grants two off days to the other minority and offers zero for Eid al-Fatr and Eid al-Adha. Two does not equal zero in this instance. Three, I requested the first day of Ramadan to be on the calendar for information so teachers would know the importance of that day for the Muslim students. Mr. Duke declined to do so without an objective explanation. The first day of Ramadan is Thursday, March 23, 2023. Eid al-Fatr is on Friday, April 21st, 2023. Mr. Duke rejected the Eid without a legitimate reason. Eid al-Adha is on June 28, 2023. I requested it to be on the calendar for information to the teachers and staff. Mr. Duke has rejected that without legitimate reason. I always ask for equality. And Thank you. Next is Sean Robinson.
There are no randomized controlled trials with verified outcomes that show a benefit to healthcare workers or community members for wearing a mask or a respirator. There is no definitive study that exists to show a benefit from a broad policy to wear masks in public. While the sports arena is crowded with hundreds of people unmasked, yet our children have to attend school six to seven hours wearing a mask. If there were any benefit wearing a mask because of the blocking power against droplets and aerosol particles, there should be more benefit from wearing a respirator compared to surgical masks. Neither masks nor respirators protect. Cloth coverings are essentially worthless. It should be noted that surgical masks are primarily designed to protect the environment from the wearer, whereas the respirators are supposed to protect the wearer from the environment. Coronavirus 0125 microns in size. Masks and respirators fill particles 0 30 to 080 microns in size. No bias-free study has ever found a benefit from wearing a mask or respirator in this application. Let me be clear. Masks offer no protection. Masks are not an effective way of protection from infections. And masks have disclaimers saying cannot prevent acquiring an infection, which is the back which is in the back of the box. Masks increase the risk of contracting infection. Masks can become contaminated very quickly. Every time the wearer breathes in, they inhale contaminants. Masks can harm the wearer. Masks limit oxygen intake and increase carbon dioxide. Masks are dangerous for people. The teachers union influenced the CDC on school reopenings. BCPS was given the COVID-19 economic relief, receiving thousands of dollars, reducing risks of virus transformation. BCPS K through 12 has incorporated the CDC operations strategy. BCPS are getting paid to thousands of dollars to mass our children. Conclusion. The rights of the American citizens proceed from the creator, not from government. Government authority proceeds only from the consent of the people. Individuals including the unborn have the intrinsic right to liberty, life, and pursuit of happiness. Baltimore County Public Schools employees are public servants and public servants. It is your sole responsibility to understand the limitations of your authority and act within the legal boundaries provided to you by General Assembly. It has been suggested by some con constitutional law attorneys that normally promulgating rules which exceed your, govern your given authority could be grounds for ouster lawsuits in the state of Maryland and perhaps you to lose governmental immunity and be held liable for damages. Informed consent is the way. Unmask our children. Ignorance of the law will be no excuse. Stop the child abuse. That's it. Thank you. Next is Angela Leitzer. My name is Angela Leitzer. I'm the chairperson for TABCO Retired, the only retiree group affiliated with TABCO, MSCA, <coughs> excuse me, and NEA. I retired after teaching 38 years in BCPS. Retired educators were stunned to receive a letter from the BCPS Employee Benefits Manager dated July 23rd, stating that they are being defaulted into a new medical plan managed by a private entity, Labor First. This has caused widespread anger and fear. Why? For several reasons. Number one, because the rationale stated by representatives of Baltimore County government is that funding for retiree benefits is due to run out unless they save millions of dollars. This is even though in 2018 we received this information. Quote, the Baltimore County Trust Fund for Retiree Medical Benefits, OPEB, Other Post-Employment Benefits, contained over $422 million in assets on June 20th, 2017. This is a significant investment when compared to annual claims costs of approximately $95 million. The rate of return on OPEB plan investments was 13.5% in fiscal year 2017, generating more than $50 million for the fund. The county's various reserve accounts are managed strategically with a 30-year outlook. In fact, 
Baltimore County is far better funded than any of the 50 states except Alaska, end of quote. To say that we are wondering what happened to $422 million and the projections for the fiscal health of the fund is an understatement. Secondly, this letter to retirees was sent without notifying you, the Board of Education, according to several of you. This begs the question, who made this decision and why was the board left out? Although TABCO has repeatedly asked when retirees will receive benefits booklets in order to compare costs and coverages before the October 15th open enrollment, no information has been forthcoming. Thirdly, when retired educators chose employment in BCPS many years ago, it was with the expectation that our low salaries would be offset in our retirement years with pension and health care benefits that constituted deferred compensation. Now we see the writing on the wall. A process is in place to use the fact that many elderly retirees will not understand how to exit from the default plan. Thank you. Next is Jean Sachs. Hello, I'm Jane Sachs, an active member of TABCO Retired, the only retiree group affiliated with TABCO, MSEA, and NEA. According to documents that outline the rights and responsibilities of the Board of Education, quote, the Board of Education of Baltimore County is authorized by Maryland law to determine, with advice of the county superintendent, the educational policies of the county school system, unquote. The authority for the budget is with the board, with the advice of the superintendent to quote from the rules and responsibilities of the board, quote, each year the board approves a budget designed to finance the county public school program. The budget is based upon the goals and policies of the board, is developed by the superintendent and other appropriate school personnel, and is considered and adopted by the board, unquote. When I signed the contract to work for BCPS, I was promised health care provided by BCPS when I retired. I, it was one of the reasons I chose BCPS over other school systems. According to the rules and responsibilities of the board, quote, the Board of Education of Baltimore County recognizes that providing eligible employees with insurance and benefits is an important factor in the recruitment and retention of highly qualified employees. Group health insurance benefits will be provided in accordance with the terms of the eligible employees ratified negotiated bargaining agreement, unquote. How is it then possible that a change in the negotiated health insurance for retirees, a form of delayed compensation, occurred without the board knowledge or approval? At least three members of the board's report, the board reported that they had no knowledge of Labor First becoming not only the manager of retiree health care, but also the default option. A letter was sent to retirees from BCPS stating this action. If the board did not know or approve, who gave the order to send the letter? I believe I am speaking for many of the 8,000 retirees when I say the board has relinquished its obligation to past and present employees of BCPS. Retirees are told their health care is changing among a global pandemic. The process of negotiation has been circumvented. BCPS extols the virtue of restorative justice. Here is your chance. To restore the integrity all around, the board must restore the status quo of medical benefits for retirees and not have labor first as the default. There must be transparency on who ordered the letter to be sent and who knew, and who knew it would be sent. This might restore the negotiation process and the authority of the board. Not taking this action will have many negative ramifications impacting both the school system and the county. Thank you very much. Thank you. Our next speaker is Mr. Brian Fisher. Good evening, everyone. Uh, it's a pleasure to be here. Uh, I just want to say uh, the last time I was here, uh, I was representing the Towson community and uh, asking for the board's leadership uh, for contributing money uh, towards the study for uh, a new Towson and Delaney High School. 
Uh, I want to begin by introducing uh, my, a little bit of my, my background, uh, but first I want to say that I am speaking uh, individually tonight uh, in behalf of no one except myself. Uh, I am the immediate past president of the Towson Communities Alliance, the, one of the largest community associations in the state of Maryland. I'm also a former board member of Historic Towson, Inc., and a current uh, board member of the Preservation Alliance of Baltimore County. I have a degree in historic preservation, and I have been uh, working and volunteering in the field uh, since graduating from Mary Washington College in 2003. Um, <clears throat> with that said, um, I want to echo uh, what the earlier testimony of uh, Ms. evans Latocha, a member of the Landmarks Preservation Commission, uh, about the concern regarding the plans for Towson High School that did not include any mention of its status as a Baltimore County landmark. Under uh, Baltimore County landmark uh, rules and historic preservation law, the county rules are the strongest protection for buildings. Um, th the fact that this study occurred and the, the folks that did it did not even mention it is like if you were buying a house and your realtor didn't mention that there were covenants on the property or that there were uh, a ground rent or some other kind of uh, restrictions on the property. It's astonishing to me. Um, previously, I had worked with this organization as well as the county school system to develop a comprehensive rehabilitation and reopening plan for the former Lock Raven Elementary, also a county landmark. That would have, in essence, resulted in a new school from top to bottom. Um, it would have required, and we had approval of the Landmarks Preservation Commission to uh, uh, demolish a portion of the non-contributing, non-historic part of the building to add an addition, and would have followed the Secretary of the Interior standards for rehabilitating historic buildings. This was an outstanding plan that was uh, achieved broad consensus across the community, as well as uh, from the LPC and all of the stakeholders, and we remain very disappointed that it was not followed through. Towson High is in exactly the same position. If anything, it's in a better position because it is not currently in the state that the former Lock Raven Elementary is in. The school construction funds that are set aside, that are requested for a new school can and must be used for a comprehensive rehabilitation and addition to Towson High so that it can be expanded to meet our population and serve the needs of our community. If you have any questions, otherwise I yield my remaining time. Thank you. Our next speaker is Hillary Schaefer. Good evening, members of the board. My name is Hillary Zalk Schaefer, and for over a decade, I have been a proud BCPS teacher. At Woodmore Elementary, I was a classroom teacher and special educator. And currently, I'm a STEM and math resource teacher at Sandy Plains Elementary. Tonight, I'm here to advocate for our paraprofessionals, educators who advocate for our students every single day. Like teachers, the paras often work before and after school day contract hours. They lead high quality small group instruction and they support the general function of the school. And I could list many other similarities. But you see, our paraprofessionals are unparalleled because let's take a great example. Children enter elementary school, oftentimes in pre-K or kindergarten, and they don't leave till fifth grade. But you see, the paraprofessionals are there that entire time. So students have the consistency of some of these same educators. While they go from different homerooms each year, those paraprofessionals are a consistent and continuous source of support, encouragement, and I'll also say that the paras are a key element of scaffolded instruction. Why? Because they know student strengths. They also know individual student needs because they've worked with the students for such a long time, continuously. They understand how our students can be successful, and they also understand how our students need to be encouraged. Many of the paraprofessionals I've worked with also have deep institutional knowledge of the school communities. Many times they've worked there for 10, 15, sometimes even 20 years, 
and they've often sent their own children to the school. So there really is that deep community connection to parents and families. I will say again that the role of paraprofessionals in our schools is unparalleled. They create safe spaces for our students. They create safe tones for our students. Their role fosters equity and their roles foster the social emotional learning that we want for every student in Baltimore County Public Schools. And so I ask you tonight for your support for our paraprofessionals by way of increased staffing, restructured wage scales, and the promise of no layoffs and no furloughs for them, for our schools, and for our students. Thank you for your time and good evening. Thank you. And that concludes our portion of public comments. Okay, and um, I just want to tell board members, um, do I have a motion to go into a brief recess? So moved. Is there a second? second? Thank you. Do we need to do a roll call vote for that? For recess? Okay, we'll just call a recess for 10 minutes? 15 minutes? Okay, thank you.
strong. Are you still hungry? Yeah, I got these. Okay, we're going to get started. If board members could return to their seats, please. Do you want another protein bar? Oh, no. Thank you, everyone, for returning. So we can get started. The next item on the agenda is action taken in closed session. And for that, I call on, call on Ms. Bressler. Thank you, Madam Chair. Um, I'm sorry that Mr. Uh, Bersades was unable to make it this evening, but I'm very pleased to be here in his place. Uh, during closed session earlier this evening, the board voted uh, on a tentative agreement with TAPCO. Um, and I think now would be an appropriate time to confirm that action. Thank you, Ms. Bressler. May I have a motion to approve the action taken in closed session on the ratification of the agreement between BCPS and TABCO for 2021 to 2022? So moved, Offerman. Second, Mac. Thank you. Any discussion? Ms. Gover, may I have a roll call vote, please? Ms. Reynolds? Yes. Ms. Fox? Yes. Ms. Mack? Yes. Ms. McWilliams? Yes. Ms. Jones? Yes. Ms. Hen? Yes. Mr. Thomas? Yes. I'm sorry. It's okay. Mr. Offerman? Yes. Ms. Fox-Jerry? Yes. Dr. Hager? Yes. Mr. Kuhn votes yes. Yes. Thank you. Thank you. All right. The next item on the agenda, which was added earlier this evening, is consideration of the revised board handbook. May I have a motion to confirm the approval of the revised board handbook? So oh. moved, Ms. Pastor. Is there a second? Second, Offerman. Thank you. Any discussion? May I have a roll call vote, please, Ms. Gover? Ms. Brown? Yes. Ms. Fox? Abstain. Ms. Mack? Yes. Mr. McWilliams? Yes. Ms. Jones? Yes. Ms. Hen? Yes. Mr. Thomas? Yes. Mr. Yes. Mr. Yes. Dr. Yes. Mr. Yes. 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 Thank you. Thank you. The next item on the agenda is the report on the proposed options for the 2022 to 2023 school year, excuse me, school calendar. And for that, I call on Ms. Charlie Green and Mr. Duke. Good evening, Board Chair Scott, Vice Chair Hen, Dr. Williams, and members of the Board of Education. We are here this evening to bring forward calendar options for the 2022-2023 school year. Uh, at this time, I will turn it over to Mr. George Duke. Good evening, Madam Chair, Vice Chair Hen, Dr. Williams, and members of the board. In accordance with board policy and superintendent's rule 6301, the calendar committee was convened on June 9th and June 16th of 2021 to consider and to provide the board with one or more calendar options for the 22-23 school year. The committee chose to provide the board with a pre-Labor Day and a post-Labor Day option for its consideration. It, however, by majority vote, was in favor of a pre-Labor Day start for the 22-23 school year. The committee based its recommendation on the following considerations. A pre-Labor Day start would afford students with an additional week of instruction prior to the administration of performance and AP assessments. Also, the committee shared the concerns of families who would be faced with childcare challenges in late August due to the lack of organized summer camps or activity programs for children. 
since most programs end in early or mid-August. Members of the committee also felt that delaying the start of the school year until after Labor Day was disadvantageous to BCPS student athletes who have already returned to school campuses in early August and are ready to return to the classroom by late August. In a normal school year, this can be up to 6,000 students. Regardless of what option the board chooses, the committee recommended that the board take a position on future calendars for the sake of consistency and for the benefit of the BCPS community. For many years, the community always knew <clears throat> that the BCPS school year would begin in late August prior to Labor Day. It only has been in recent years since the governor's post-Labor Day proclamation that BCPS families have had to wait until late November to find out <clears throat> whether an upcoming school year would begin pre or post Labor Day. The committee felt that the board should come to a consensus position as to whether future school years will always start prior to or after Labor Day. This concludes my presentation and I'll be happy to answer any questions. <clears throat> Thank you. Yes, Mr. McMillian. Mr. Duke, I'm curious, did you petition the Maryland State Department of Education and ask them if emergency closure days could be taught virtually? Um, no, I did not petition. Uh, Comar has not been changed. We still have to build three inclement weather days at a minimum into the calendar. Did your committee discuss teaching virtually? Um, I believe that it did come up. Uh, I don't recall off the top of my head how extensive a conversation um, it was. Thank you. Yes, Dr. Hager. Um, thank you for your work on this committee. Um, I agree that the um, what you were saying about child care being a real issue at the end of August, I think that is a very, very real issue for a lot of families, especially um, families with limited resources. Uh, it, it can be a nightmare and um, teachers also who need to come back into buildings. So I just want to reiterate what you, what you were saying about that. Um, what is the um, what was the committee's discussion around the Muslim holidays and adding those as uh, days off for students or adding them to the calendar? Um, whenever a Muslim or a Jewish holiday falls on a school day, that day is um, annotated on the calendar as a professional development day. Students are not in school and teachers are in school. Um, with professional development. Um, in um, 2023, Eid al-Fitr falls on a Saturday and Eid al-Adha falls on June 29th after the end of the school year. So since they did not fall on a weekday, um, we did not include that as a professional development day. Uh, in contrast to that, both of the Jewish holidays uh, did fall on a weekday. Therefore, in accordance with um, the board policy, um, they were uh, annotated in the, on the calendar as a professional development day. Thank you. And um, to the point of someone who spoke earlier, would the committee be willing to um, acknowledge Ramadan on the calendar as the start of Ramadan for awareness among teachers and staff? I mean, that is something that can be included. Um, and quite frankly, I don't recall the conversation around Ramadan. Mm -hmm. Uh, I would have to go back and look at the minutes to see whether or not that was discussed. Um, but we normally uh, annotate other instances such as Flag Day or Maryland Day, uh, which is not a holiday, but it is annotated on the calendar. Thank you so much. Additional questions? Yes, Ms. Mack. Mr. Duke, I'm looking at the pre-Labor Day calendar. And I see in June that um, the last day of classes for preschool and pre-K is the 13th of June, the last day um, all schools close early for students on the 14th, and then last day of classes is the 15th. But when I go to the end of that and I look at the emergency closure dates, can you help? The, the dates are all before then I don't think I understand your question so it's that's the, the calendar is built incorporating the five inclement weather days and so based on incorporating oh, okay. 
Okay, so if we don't have inclement weather days. The calendar will be amended and will end earlier. So we would end, let's say we had none. I presume then we would end on June 8th. Correct, and it's annotated in the calendar. Can you? If no emergency closure days occur, the school year will end for students on Thursday, June 8th of 2023. It's on the on page five. Okay, Here. I jumped from four to, okay. I see that then. So a pre-labor day would, with no emergency closures would be the eighth. Correct. Okay, thank you for that clarification. Thank you. Any other questions from board members? Yes, Ms. Rowe. So, Mr. Duke, in 2014, the General Assembly convened a uh, post, a task force to study starting school post Labor Day. And the task force recommendation was, quote, while the task force considered the sub recommendations of the work groups, the task force accepted and passed only one recommendation. On May 19, 2014, a motion was made to recommend to the governor a post Labor date start date for Maryland public schools. The motion was carried by a vote of 12 votes for the recommendation and three votes against the recommendation. Um, I've emailed the whole board the PDF of this task force uh, final recommendations and document. And so what I'd like to know is, did the kid committee consider the findings in that task force? No, we did meeting? not. The proclamation was uh, rescinded and the decision to start pre or post Labor Day was reverted back to the boards where it, it had existed prior to the proclamation by the governor as a result of that committee. Okay, so the calendar, but did the calendar committee consider the other issues outlined in the findings of the task force that resulted in their recommendation to the governor? Mm. Because their recommendation is a start date of no earlier than September 1st each year. The short answer to your question is no. Is no. Okay, thank you. Any additional questions from board members? Yes, Ms. Causey? I have a... They can go first. I'm sorry, was there somebody on the phone? Yes, Ms. Scott, this is Molly. Ms. Jones, okay. Yes, go ahead, Ms. Jones. Thank you. Uh, so, Mr. Duke, you just kind of answered my question. That whole study that was done has been rescinded, and the decision is again parlayed back to the local school boards, correct? That's correct. To make that decision. Okay. And along that decision, I believe, was made based with business owners in Ocean City in mind and not really from a whole equitable education parents which um, point of view. And also every school system differs based on local conditions. Um, my question, I guess, is in terms of the um, the Ramadan holidays, which seems to differ. Was that something that uh, will keep this changing every calendar year because it does change based on the lunar calendar? So was that um, included in there? Uh, it, it was not, and as I said previously, I don't recall if, if actually Ramadan was uh, discussed at the calendar committee meetings, I would have to go back and consult the minutes uh, to refresh my memory. But um, I believe that your observation relative to the shifting of the start of Ramadan and the end of Ramadan is correct, that it's based on um, the lun lunar calendar. Okay, thank you. Thank you. Ms. Causey? Thank you, Madam Chair. Um, thank you, Mr. Duke, and I appreciate the efforts of everyone that's on the calendar committee. I know that that's a, a committee that works um, for a long time in trying to get this right. I also appreciate your comments and um, the issue of the board uh, with the superintendent's recommendations and discussion with staff come to a consensus for consistency. Um, I would ask, um, have the other adjacent districts, um, because we know some of our um, teachers live in other districts, um, been considered, Anne Arundel, Carroll, and Harford? Um, have been considered in, in what respect? In the calendar committee's uh, decisions. 
Uh, no, we normally just look at it from our perspective. Um, we don't really pay attention to whether or not the adjacent uh, jurisdictions start a pre or a post. And, and also it's been, um, the calendar committees do not meet at the same time um, and calendars are not posted uh, at the same time. Um, we do just out of uh, interest do look at other jurisdictions um, for comparison purposes at times, but I don't recall that we actually took that into consideration when we were developing the, the two options. Okay, thank you. Um, the board received an email from a, a teacher stakeholder uh, that indicated that Anne Arundel, Carroll, and Hartford County have um, adopted post Labor Day starts. Is that something that um, you could confirm for the board? Certainly. Okay, thank you. Um, and uh, one of the other issues is you mentioned athletics, um, and there's approximately 6,000 students involved in that. Um, who sets the athletic calendar for um, when students start? Uh, I would believe it would be the, uh, the athletic department. Um, they're uh, usually uh, the students come back uh, either for tryouts or for starting um, practice for the, the fall sports. Um, there are quite a few fall sports, not just football, um, which accounts for the, the large number of students that are returning to campus in early August. And I don't know the exact date of, of when they actually return, and I would think that that probably fluctuates from year to year. So the athletic start is up to the county, it's not up to the state? I believe so, but I would have to confirm that. Okay, Madam, thank Madam you. Chair, the, the athletic schedule is up to the state, the MPSSAA, I believe I said that correctly, is a Maryland organization for athletics. They work collectively with all the athletic supervisors and directors of every school system. And I do, since I have the mic, I do want to remind the board, uh, we uh, amended what we provided you based on your feedback that we provided a pre and post Labor Day. We were not looking at other systems, but really meeting your needs. When we used to make one recommendations, thank you, Mr. Duke, we decided uh, based on pre-pandemic conversations, I believe, to provide both a pre and post for your determination as to what the calendar will look like. Thank you. Thank you for Thank that, you, Dr. Dr. Williams. Um, yeah, I believe Mr. Offerman, no? Okay, Mr. Thomas. Mm -hmm. Okay, thank you, and thank you, Ms. Charlie Green and Mr. Duke for presenting this. Um, I'm looking at the post-Labor Day calendar, and for June 2023, um, Juneteenth is on uh, June 19th uh, that year, that's a Monday, and it's marked in the side, um, that there's an asterisk next to Juneteenth for June 20th. Um, and so my question is, if the school year does extend until June 22nd for the post-Labor Day schedule, then we would have off school for June 19th, uh, for Juneteenth, and so would that affect the course of the school year and make the um, end date be the 23rd of uh, June? I believe that there's been no decision, at least that I'm aware of, as to the observance of Juneteenth. If Juneteenth were to be observed, then the school year would be extended to um, Friday the 23rd. Okay. Um, is Juneteenth a statewide holiday or a federal holiday? I believe that it is not. Okay. Um, all right, thank you. Uh, my other question goes back to one of Mr. McMillian's questions about um, possibly having virtual instruction during snow days. Um, with that possibility, uh, or is that a possibility is my first question. I would have to go ahead and pursue that with, with MSDE to see whether or not they would accept it as a, as a uh, school day. The problem with uh, remote uh, instruction on an inclement weather day is that sometimes the decision to close schools is not made until early morning hours of the day of closure. There are occasions, however, where the decision is made pen based on forecasts um, the evening before. Um, and the reason I'm saying that is that teachers would need to be prepared not only with lesson plans for remote instruction, but they would also have to ensure that all of their students would be um, equipped with their devices. And then we also have the issues of um, hot spots because not all uh, teachers or students for that matter uh, would have a ready access to the internet. So it makes it, it sounds like it might be a, a, an easy alternative, but there are a lot of other underlying issues that, 
that impact of the ability of all students to be engaged on those days in meaningful instruction. Okay. Um, and I, when we proposed the, I think the 2022 school year calendar, um, I had brought up a, com a question about professional development and if our uh, teachers who are of Muslim and Jewish faith, if they, would they be missing from professional development? And you said that um, they, there would be opportunities for students to make, or for teachers to make up that, the, those professional development opportunities that they have. However, there have been multiple instances and multiple emails we've had from the board where uh, special educators and our teachers are not able to have meetings with their fellow staff members, where our special educators are not able to work on their IEPs or, or prepare for their lessons because they are observing their faith on these days off. Um, and so is it possible for us to um, have awfulness as a school completely and to have a complete, thank you, and to uh, have a complete day off and uh, schedule professional development days for other days? Um, would that extend the school year more? If so, uh, would that cause any problems? Uh, well, it wouldn't cause any problems other than it would impact the number of teacher days. Um, if you, the, the board uh, convened, the PRC, uh, the, the uh, Policy Review Committee um, undertook a study to determine uh, how to address the, the Muslim and the Jewish holidays. And at that time, the recommendation by the board was made that these holidays would be professional development days, that students would be off, but that teachers would um, be in the, the school houses um, uh, with professional development. Um, again, that would be a decision that the board would have to make prior to the PRC uh, coming to the, um, the decision that impacts the calendars that we are presenting today and previous calendars, um, we had been closed on the Jewish holidays. Uh, and then the question of equity with the Muslim holidays arose and the, and the board uh, took the position that um, they would become professional development days for teachers and students would be off so that students could be with their families to um, uh, celebrate the, the holidays. Um, the master agreements allow um, staff to take two religious um, holiday, um, paid holidays in addition to the urgent personal business. So they have a total of five that they can use for religious purposes. Um, and I think that that probably also played into the decision that the PRC uh, came to when they made the recommendation that those days be professional development days. Thank you. And do you know when that PRC decision was made? Oh. Um, I want to say possibly six, seven years ago. Okay. Um, as a new board, I ask us that we will at some point reconsider that um, and, and look into that in the future in PRC as a member of PRC too. Um, and I know I only have a few seconds left. So uh, can you please describe some of the benefits to a pre-labor uh, school year and some of the benefits to a post-labor school year? Well, I think I addressed some of them in my comments. Uh, the committee felt that um, a pre-labor day start would allow students to be in seats uh, an additional week prior to the administration of assessments. Um, they felt that um, a pre-Labor Day start um, would be more beneficial to families, uh, a large number of families within the, the, the uh, school system um, who, have, who have limited resources and don't have the ability to keep their, uh, their students in um, summer camps or other programs because those programs are usually done by mid-August to, to late August. Um, they, the ability to end the school year earlier um, obviously is an advantage to a pre-Labor Day start. Um, the post-Labor Day, it affords um, families uh, an additional, the ones that can take advantage of the additional time to extend their summer holiday. Um, one of the disadvantages of the post, obviously, is that um, the possibility of, of extending in later into uh, June um, is, is, a, is a reality. Thank you. Okay, thank you so much, Mr. Duke and Ms. Charlie Green. Yep. Um, um, wanted to, I did a quick search, um, and I saw, just to let you know that um, uh, President Biden signed the Juneteenth bill, creating a new federal holiday commemorating the end of slavery in the United States. So it is a federal holiday. Okay. So I just wanted to come on and say that. Yes, Ms. Pestor. Okay. Uh, Mr. Duke, 
we've talked about the impact on students, but tell us what the impact or the differences are because that is a question that has come up from some of our staff in terms of days. I tried counting. Okay, that didn't work well. Just uh, trying to figure out or making sure that teachers and staff are getting pretty much equitable numbers of days off in the summer because we want them to come back refreshed and happy as well. You've done a great job with the duty days and all of that. How does that look in terms of staff? Pre well, and post? Please. obviously if the school year ends um, later in the summer and starts earlier in, in the fall, uh, and I'll use fall, um, obviously the summer break is, is shorter. Um, if it ends earlier in the summer, the school year ends earlier in June and starts um, at the end of August, mm -hmm. um, I'm not sure how that compares with the number of days because I've really, to be quite honest, I've never actually sat down and counted the number of, of, of days that comprise the summer break yeah. from the and end I of school. I did try to do that, but it was sort of, it became mystical, so I stopped. <laughs> Um, thank you. Thank you. Any other questions or comments? Oh, yes, Ms. Um, Rowe? I just wanted to um, clarify something about the religious holidays because I remember when they became the professional development days instead, and the reason is because when the school system gives a religious holiday off, it is not because it's a religious holiday. It is because the only way you can give a religious holiday off of school is either if it's a Comar holiday, which is mandated in state law, or if having school on that holiday, what was that? If that holiday having school would end up with a, such an attendance vacancy that it is the attendance is the justification for closing the school, not the religion. Thank you, Ms. Rowe. Any other questions? Yes. Thank you, Madam Chair. Um, and I do want to thank uh, Dr. Hager and Mr. Thomas and um, Ms. Rowe, uh, questions and comments regarding equity with um, our Muslim and Jewish um, teachers and community and students. Um, I also wanted to point out that for, um, in support of a post Labor Day start, one of the benefits is that our students that are involved in agricultural endeavors um, have county, and they're, involved, they're engaged countywide. <clears throat> Hereford High School has a special program in agriculture, but there are other students that are involved countywide, and they have, excuse me? 30 seconds. 30 seconds. Oh, thank you. Um, and they have culminating competitions at the Maryland State Fair. And we've heard regularly from uh, the agricultural community that it is a hardship to start school before Labor Day as they are um, attending for their competitions. Um, and um, so I, I think that that's something that needs to be considered and it, and it has been important in the past. Um, agriculture is one of the largest industries in the state of Maryland and when we're talking about uh, having children having the opportunity to be college and career ready, it's important to expand uh, awareness and exposure around those industries that are growing where there is opportunity. Uh, Ms. Causey, I took your previous comments um, around the agricultural programs to heart and I tried to determine exactly how many BCPS students participated in the um, Maryland State Fair. Um, and I, I'm, I'm not totally sure on the total validity of this number um, because um, we don't have any formal participation through BCPS. The students participate through uh, associated 4-H programs or as a result of perhaps summer employment on a farm or actually working on their own farm. The total number of students that I was able to confirm was seven. Um, I also tried to determine how many students are actually in the agricultural program, and unfortunately I did not have that number uh, before coming to the board meeting. Okay, thank you for um, that effort. I can um, assure you from attending some of the um, shows and competitions that it is more than that, but, um, but I do not have the number for the agricultural program. Um, so anyway, but thank you for that. The um, last question I had is in, in, oh, 
was any surveys of staff considered? Um, not at this uh, iteration of the committee. However, uh, TABCO had indicated that its constituents, based on its last survey, were in favor of a pre-Labor Day start. Okay, thank you. And a survey of students. That's uh, Thomas Causey. Thank you. We next have a question from Ms. Jose. Thank you, Ms. Scott. So, Ms. Mr. Duke, just to clarify, you just said we have over 111,000 children in the school system, and you could only verify seven of them participate in the agricultural program. That, did I hear that right? Yes. Um, what I was able to glean from um, contacting the CTE program that they were aware of seven students who had actually participated in the state fair. They caveated that by saying that there might be more. However, since they are not affiliated with BCPS or their participation is not through BCPS sponsorship, that there might be more. And um, they really had no way at this point in time uh, to provide me with a, a um, more complete number. Um, although I have asked them to see if, if they could go ahead and verify um, additional um, participation. Okay, thank you. And so that's on you. I'm going to break into the 1% out of 111,000 children. Uh, the next question is to Dr. Williams. Um, standardized testings happen at the same time across the country. Um, and so does a pre-Labor Day start in your experience and knowledge since you've been doing this? Does that uh, impact kids' time to prepare for those tests, in particular SAT and AP tests? which will determine, you know, college acceptance. Is that some, something that um, you're aware of or have a, uh, one way or the other? Well, thank you, Ms. Jones. There, there, you, you raised an interesting point about the standardized tests outside of the state of Maryland. There are fixed times, such as the SAT multiple times. Um, and so, um, again, we, we wanted to bring, based on the request from the board, both a pre and post. But I just have to say this, as a former teacher, and all the former teachers sitting around the board, and parents, something happens after Memorial Day in the school system, <laughs> in every school system. It's like the month of June, folks are like, can we just end the school year? So we've had these conversations each year but the reality is it's the optics. It's something that happens with Memorial Day and then graduations are happening and it feels like the year is coming to a close. So, so sometimes put your parent hat on, sometimes if you're educated, put your educator hat on. Um, and so I, I, it's interesting, we thank you Mr. Duke for sharing the perspective of TAPCO. Yeah. Folks are tired. Mm -hmm. Folks are tired by the time it gets to June 1st. So, so, and so in essence, we will constantly look at the assessment schedule and we will plan accordingly in terms of local as well as state. And then we have multiple national assessments that we can plan either way. So thank you for that question, Ms. Jones. Thank you, Ms. Mack. Mr. Duke, prior to getting being on the board, I thought that school always started after Labor Day because my kids always started after Labor Day. Now, granted, my youngest child is 32. Um, when did it change? Because you, you said for many, many years we have had a pre-Labor Day start and we, you know, for consistency's sake, we need to look at maybe getting back to that. But do you have any historical data to say when it moved away from a post-Labor Day? I, I don't, and I don't recall when the uh, proclamation actually took place. I know that um, when I came to the board, uh, to, to BCPS in 2010, um, the calendar um, was um, a, a pre-Labor Day calendar, and it was a pre-Labor Day calendar um, for numerous years up until that proclamation. I would have to find the, uh, the date of the proclamation. Um, and once that proclamation uh, took effect, then we had to go to a, a post-Labor Day. And then that lasted for a few years, and then the decision was made to allow the decision to, to revert back to the local boards. And the reason I was involved in the calendars um, was because I would sit down with 
with TAPCO and the unions um, to discuss the development of the calendar and to get their input um, in preparation for the calendar committee. I don't want you to go back and check anything, but I just clearly remember as a new board member thinking, I don't ever recall as a parent having an option. We always went back after Labor Day, but I can't even sit here and tell you what year my kids graduated, so I can't even make that connection. Um, and so you don't need to check, but I did just want to point that out. At some point, it was for all three of my kids always post Labor Day. There, there was a um, prior to 2010, and I don't know how prior to 2010. Uh, yeah, to do the math. There was a, there was uh, because I, I was told anecdotally that BCPS started post Labor Day. That's what I. And thought. then we went to a pre Labor Day start, and 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 I used 2010 because that was um, my entry into the school system, and for numerous years after that, at least five, uh, it was always a, a pre-Labor Day start. Okay, well, Up thank until you. the proclamation. Okay, thank you. Thank you. Mr. Offerman? Ms. Scott, when, when will we, excuse me, when will we vote on this? It's not today. Um, I guess I, I would that. ask Dr. Williams, do we have a date? Mr. Duke, would you check the calendar? I think it's coming back. In November, but first in November. I know it's Wait. in November. I just November uh, the 9th. first meeting in November. First meeting in November. Yes, November Thank 9th. you. So this is first yeah. reader, and then there's public comment, and then mm -hmm. third reader. Okay. Thank you for that, uh, Mr. McMillian. Mr. Duke, based on my experience as a teacher, it appeared to me that the f longer the school year extended into June, the lower the school-wide attendance was. Did your committee look at system-wide attendance in June? No, we didn't get into that. That Thank kind you. of detail. Thank you. Any additional questions? No? Okay. Thank you both very much for the presentation. All right. And the next item on the agenda is the report on the opening of schools. And for that, I call on Dr. Williams, Ms. Byers, Dr. Jones, Dr. Roberts, and Ms. Tillman. Good evening, Chair Scott, Vice Chair Hen, Dr. Williams, and members of the board. This evening, we are happy to bring forward to you an update on the opening of schools for the 2021-2022 school year. Joining me this evening are Mrs. Christina Byers, Community Superintendent for the Central Zone, Dr. Raquel Jones, Community Superintendent for the West Zone, and Mrs. Lauren Tillman, Principal, Principal of Scotts Branch Elementary School. Next slide, please. On August 30th, 2021, we happily welcomed back approximately 105,000 students to the school for in-person learning. For many of our students, this was the first time in school or the first time back since March of 2020. Our school-based staff and families experienced a wide range of emotions, from excitement to curiosity regarding the start of the school year. The work of our school leaders and their staff cannot be emphasized enough. And this evening, the purpose of this presentation is to give you the insight into how schools and those who support them opened our schools in an unprecedented time. Mrs. Byers will now share some brief information regarding support offered to schools for the opening of this school year. Next slide, please. So thank you, Dr. Roberts, and good evening, everyone. This graphic represents the core work of the Division of School Support and Achievement and it is grounded in research from the University of Washington Center for Educational Leadership. In supporting our schools during the opening of schools, the Division of School Support and Achievement worked with individual school leadership teams to prepare our leaders and their schools for the start of the school year. Throughout the summer, leaders in schools were meeting with their leadership teams in order to conduct instructional planning and preparation, as well as preparation to meet the social emotional needs of our students. 
Our team worked directly with schools to develop their school progress plans. Our school progress plans really ground the work for our schools in terms of professional learning and building capacity of our staff. Additionally, our school progress plans are designed to ameliorate the persistent and widening gaps that exist specifically for our underserved populations. All of our schools have posted a snapshot of their school progress plan on their website. The Division of School Support and Achievement also created data monitoring calendars for our principals to assist them in utilizing data in order to diagnose gaps and assess student achievement and performance as they work through our curriculum. Additionally, we supported our schools for opening with regard to staffing their schools and ensuring that their facilities were ready for the safe and secure return of all of our students. At this time, Dr. Jones is going to share information regarding the first week of school. Next slide, please. Good evening. During the first week of schools, the Division of School Support and Achievement had an incredible opportunity to visit all 175 schools and programs. In alignment with our school support model, we observed the instructional program, specifically the implementation of social emotional learning and our new curriculum. Our school leaders, staff, students, and families spent time getting to know one another, creating spaces and conditions for social emotional learning, including class meetings, hosting extended homerooms, and implementing conscious discipline at the elementary level, PBIS, and restorative practices. These visits gave us an opportunity to really witness the awesome power of teamwork within our schools. Our principals, our assistant principals, our teacher leaders, and all of our staff, including paraprofessionals and the office staff, really chipped in to make sure that the opening of a grand event for all of, our, all of our students. Our DSSA team had the wonderful opportunity to also step in and chip in um, as it related to carpool lines, helping out in the cafeteria, and really just meeting with the instructional leadership team and teachers. Although we are only in the, about, I believe it's the fifth week of school, we've also had some incredible opportunities to observe curriculum and some great instruction, which we're very proud of. Our principals, our assistant principals, our teachers, our paraprofessionals, office staff, students, families, everyone in the community should be commended for the tremendous work that they've put in already into this year. And we are very excited about this opportunity to have one of our principals provide us an inside look into the great work that is occurring. Lauren Tillman is here with us. Some of you may be familiar with her as it relates to her work and her commitment to um, equity in our school system. But at this time, we'll turn it over to you, Lauren. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Jones. Good evening, Chairwoman Scott, Vice Chairwoman Hen, Superintendent Williams, esteemed members of the board, and BCPS staff. My name is Lauren Tillman, and I am the proud West Zone principal of Scotts Branch Elementary School. As a fifth year principal, it is my honor and my privilege to have this time with all of you. And I'm grateful to stand amongst my amazing principal principals and assistant principal colleagues to share our opening of the 2021-2022 school year. We are back <laughs> and we are ready. I know that I share this work with all of my administrator colleagues across the school system and I am honored to be one of the 176 principals charting a course for high student achievement each and every day. The staff and students of Scott's Branch send you their greetings this evening and reminded me before I left to join you a phrase that we live by as a school family. If you stay ready, you don't have to get ready. These opening weeks have been no different. We have always believed that preparation for the what ifs keeps us prepared for the what is. I can't tell you how much our educators have anticipated welcoming back the buzz of the hallways, the roaring of the school buses, the productive classroom chatter, and best of all, the smiling faces behind the masks of who we do this work for across this great system. What a time it's been. <laughs> I take a deeper breath when I say that because what a year we've been through. On March 16th, 2020, access to learning as we knew it was taken from us. We shape-shifted to a virtual world, but what we know about resiliency is that we all qualify for it. 
We just need apply. It is clear that missing in-person learning for a year does create new and additional challenges for all of us. But we've spent this time examining data on the comprehensive needs of our children. We realize that mathematics and reading, although critical, don't outweigh our responsibilities to address mental health concerns, food and housing insecurities, and to increase family engagement, all the while addressing the whole child and the academic needs. Truly our greatest enjoyment in the early weeks has been reconnecting with students. Fear is real for our students, our staff, and frankly myself, as we face the realities associated with a pandemic. But we rise every day to address the needs of all children and refuse to let what we learn during tough times go to waste. The challenges are not easy, the days are long, Nothing is perfect, but our work is equity infused, and we remain resolute in our purpose of excellence over everything. At the beginning of the school year, we received our superintendent's charge, a charge to lead our schools through the continued process of recovery, healing, and rebuilding. We stood ready. We prepared our schools for opening in our new normal. With our health and safety measures in place, our building service facilities and grounds teams deployed enhanced safety protocols in support of students and staff, and we thank them. The visuals that you see on the screen, I must say, represent merely a fraction of who we are and how we operate at Scott's Branch. From celebrating the men of excellence as role models for our young male scholars, to creating collectively a mural during teacher pre-service week, to our first, second, and third year teacher cohorts and developing our aspiring leaders pipeline. Our mural is much more than a piece of art. It represents the rich traditions built at the branch around teamwork, collaboration, the beauty of diversity, the various cultural backgrounds, and our love for Baltimore. We had the honor of hosting Dr. Williams and his team, County Executive Olczewski, and his team, our own BCPS board members, Madam Speaker of the House, Adrian Jones and her staff, union leadership, and so many more on the first day of school. Indeed, special and supported does not alone describe how our school felt that day. Next slide, please. At Scott's Branch, we're doing things a little bit differently to address access to instructional challenges as we keep our system-wide four priorities in mind to accelerate learning, ensure social emotional wellness, increase data literacy, and uphold a standard of excellence. Our school chose to specifically uplift priority four this year upon our return by crafting a standard of excellence. To start, we wanted to approach education itself differently. We had to change the narrative. Excellence over everything is our rallying cry but it didn't come without tough conversation and reflection on who we are, both individually and as a staff. Our leadership team found the word excellence had become a loosely used word that we hadn't truly defined. It was certainly our expectation, but hadn't quite become our true north. We needed a common language. We needed to standardize what excellent meant at the branch. So this summer, we held a leadership retreat to truly define what excellence meant to us. Dr. Morrow joined us to refine our vision and mission for the year in order to bring our school progress plan to life. It started with vulnerability in data and our relentless pursuit for opportunity and access for all student groups. If you know us, you know that our equity work moves freely throughout our building and we provide space to have tough conversations. We use an inquiry model to pose questions such as what would high performance feel and look like at Scott's Branch? How would equity live and breathe through our instructional practices? How do we scrutinize our data and ultimately keep student achievement paramount? The poster that you see to the right of the screen can be found all over our building to help keep that collaborative vision alive and well. Today, in terms of student performance, we are seeing improved results in data based on changes in teacher beliefs, mindset shifts, pacing for performance, and strengthening our expectations. 
As an educational leader, I love hearing stories about wins for students, but ultimately, the ending of the story should tell me how we got it done. At Scott's Branch, our how is high energy team building and anticipating learning experiences by designing classroom spaces that accommodate every learner. We designed professional learning experiences using a differentiated cohort approach and placed classroom teachers in university model learning groups. We're heavily focused on developing leaders within our building and a system of support for all teachers. As an administrative team, we are their biggest cheerleaders. To increase data literacy, our staff development teacher created in-house data workbooks that not only provide grade level teams ongoing access, but provide a comprehensive overview of student achievement for identified student groups. The workbooks identify gaps and opportunities to accelerate on standards so that we may adjust our instructional practices. We use our data oh, okay. workbooks during grade level planning in He's collaboration with data him. monitoring calendars in order to I'm sorry, adhere. one moment, excuse mm -hmm. me. Um, board members who are on the phone, could you please put yourself on mute because we're hearing you. Thank you. Apologies. No problem. We use our data workbooks during grade level planning in collaboration with data monitoring calendars in order to adhere to assessment timelines. There's much to be done, <laughs> but we have the right people in place to do so. In closing, the backbone of our school continues to be our strong bond with our community. We appreciate the work they do in partnership with us from local organizations to neighborhood churches, such as the Maryland Food Bank, Good Shepherd Kojic, Downtown Locker Room, Always Reading LLC, Zeta Phi Beta Sorority, Mental Street, Main Street Mental Health, and so many more who provide resources such as food, backpacks, clothes, and books. It's particularly memorable for our teachers to make a connection with Superintendent Williams at the Foundation's Exchangery. In just the first month of school, our community partners have supported over 300 students directly. So I thank you, Dr. Morrow and Dr. Jones, for not only serving as my executive leadership, but as partners with Scott's Branch. I appreciate the opportunity to share our journey with all of you. For those of you who visit us, visited us on the first day of school, come back and see us again. And for those of you who have not had a chance to come out and see us, our doors and our hearts are always open. At this time, I would like to turn it over to Superintendent Williams. Thank you. So I would like to commend the leadership of Principal Lauren Tillman and the staff at Scott Branch Elementary School. She is one of 176 dedicated and data-driven principals in our school system. First, I would like to acknowledge our three community superintendents, Ms. Christina Byers, Dr. Raquel Jones, and Dr. George Roberts for their oversight, yes, for their oversight and leadership of our executive directors, our school leadership teams, and our communities. Their coaching of our executive directors was evident as we are healing, recovering, and rebuilding. They are present at board meetings and are active participants in many of our community events and meetings. So you have seen them regularly. <laughs> the next group has joined us tonight and they serve as the principal coach and supervisor. And they spend hours in schools working along with our principals and instructional leadership team as a thought partner. They're usually the first call when there is a question or concern from a principal and can coach, counsel, and provide assistance associated with many topics or issues in a school building. So tonight, I've asked our executive directors to be present. I will name them alphabetical. We have Ms. Uh, Melissa D. Donato, West Zone Elementary, please stand. We have Dr. Sharonda Gregory, Central Zone Elementary. Kiria Joseph, West Zone Secondary. Dr. Heidi Miller, Central Zone Elementary. Dr. Adrian Morrow, West Zone Elementary. 
Dr. Jennifer Mullinex, East Zone Elementary Special Schools and several secondary schools. <laughs> Mr. Samuel Mustafer, Central Zone Secondary. <laughs> Eric Wilson, East Zone Elementary and several secondary. <laughs> I would like for them to stand so we can all see them as one unit. So with them and our community superintendent, they provide the support, whether it's instructional or non-instructional issues. They support our principals, our leadership teams. Again, I have watched them with my own eyes interact with school leadership, long hours, and dealing with all kinds of issues, including what I heard the other day about a bird issue <laughs> at a particular elementary school. Yep. I would like to acknowledge their work for assisting our principals with the opening of schools and providing guidance to our principals and their teams when needed. Our community superintendents and executive directors have worked tirelessly to support our schools and our school leadership. So I would like to say personally, thank you for all that you have done and continue to do for our schools and particularly for our school principals, assistant principals and school leadership team. So thank you for being here tonight. Thank you all so much. Are there any questions from board members or discussion? No? Nope. Yes, Ms. Pestor. I just want to uh, thank all of you, and I especially want to thank Ms. Tillman, um, because what they're doing at Scott's Branch is critical. It, it's the way we should be moving, and that conversation that we had early inspired by um, Ms. Scott's question goes to that heart of where we should be and what we should be doing because the reality, if you know Scott's branch, look it up. It has been traditionally for way too long the underachieving model. So listen carefully, go back and pay attention to what Ms. Tillman said tonight. It is setting a new paradigm about excellence. She named the pieces. This is where we're going and we need to be processing it and staying positive. So I want to thank you, Ms. Tillman and the team that is working with you to make Scott's Branch excellent and to make everyone understand how important those children are, not just in what you do, but what you said, Dr. Williams, on the first day about that building that sits in front of it, that it's not just what goes on inside, it's making those children in the community believe they're worthwhile based on what they see around them. So thank you. Thank you for that presentation. Thank you. Okay, the next item on the agenda is the update on the efficiency review, and for that I call on Dr. Williams. So I'm, I'm still filled based on what was just presented board members. It is always good to hear from our leadership. So again, I just want to thank Principal Tillman. Principal Tillman, you may leave so you can get some rest and go home and be prepared for tomorrow. <laughs> and your team, I think you have some folks here. Thank you. So this evening, good evening, Board Chair Scott, Vice Chair Hen, and members of the board. Tonight I present update number one of a clear path forward, our system plan to address needs outlined in the Public Works Operational Efficiency Review. Our plan will be aligned with the blueprint for Maryland's future with the goal of positioning Baltimore County Public Schools as a premier school system. My team and I will regularly update our board, our community and team DCPS during this time of change. Our partnership is critical to ensuring high quality services to our students, our staff and families of Baltimore County. Next slide, please. 
As part of our effort to recover, rebuild, and heal, we must acknowledge our current state, have frank dialogue about our path forward, and collab collaboratively create the climate and conditions necessary for collective healing. Since my last report, my team and I have met with principals, visited schools, spoken with staff, and engaged with union presidents through weekly check-ins and monthly sessions. In each of these venues, I've asked two questions, two simple questions. How are you and what do you need? I appreciate your candor. What you hear tonight incorporates much of what was shared with me. Next slide. So to ensure that we are on the same page on September 14th, I committed to the following. Significant cost savings focus on operational efficiency, identify savings, will draw from report recommendations and align with the blueprint for Maryland's future. A reorganization of central office staff to ensure the effective and efficient provision of services to schools that is respectful of the expertise and talent of dedicated members of Team BCPS. And third, a comprehensive collaborative plan to improve staff morale, communication, and stakeholder satisfaction. Development of this plan will include union presidents, executive director, PTA, and student leadership. Based on the preliminary review, call savings range from $6 million to $7 million in one year, totaling a minimum of $30 to $35 million over five years. The next two slides will detail our process for convening and engaging with multi-stakeholder groups to work across divisions. Next slide, please. So a 759 page review of our system requires a balanced and steady approach for successful implementation. Number one, division work groups. Each division work group will be assigned to one or more chapters of the report. An equity specialist an executive director, division executive director, will co-facilitate meetings with a representative group of staff from that division. Their work will be to review recommendations, identify priorities, and chart a course for implementation of next steps. Two, blueprint review team. Our blueprint review team will be co-led by division executive director and director. This team will receive and review recommendations from division work groups to ensure alignment with Blueprint of Maryland's future for possible revisions and upgrades. And three, stakeholder work group. Our stakeholder work group will be co-led by division executive director and director. Membership will consist of union presidents, representatives from all unions, PTA and other board stakeholder parent groups, SGA student councils. This work group will be tasked with identifying the desired end user experience. They will review recommendations from division work groups and provide feedback. Next slide, please. So simply put, the division work groups identify implementation priorities and submit a plan to the blueprint review team to ensure alignment with Maryland's blueprint for the future and the stakeholder group will ensure that these changes meet the needs of Team BCPS. Next slide. We will begin this process by sending division work group invitations and posting stakeholder membership applications the week of October 4th and conducting facilitator training during the weeks of October 11th and October 18th. Meetings will begin the week of October 25th they will occur bi-weekly and be scheduled for 60 to 90 minutes in duration. All meetings will include an agenda and action notes. I will continue to present detailed monthly updates to the board. Next slide. So the recommendation to reorganize the BCPS organizational structure was based on an analysis of peer districts identified by Public Works LLC. Careful review of those organizational charts revealed superintendent direct reports range from eight to 14. Our current structure has 11. After reorganization, the direct reports will be reduced to eight. 
The chart before you adopts the creation of a deputy superintendent, chief of schools, a chief financial officer, and chief information officer as recommended by Public Works LLC. As you know, we are bound by the Board of Education Poli policies and superintendent rules for hiring. Next step in the hiring process include reclassification of current positions, working with position management on newly created positions and undergoing a position review at the ERC. ERC stands for Expenditure Review Committee in order to post and fill these positions. My October update will include additional details regarding the reporting structure. Next slide, please. So the efficiency review recommends that BCPS addresses climate, work environment, and morale of staff. It further states that the Division of Organizational Effectiveness should use the survey results to create a comprehensive plan that addresses climate and morale. Based on my conversations with staff and families, I know that we have a very real customer service problem. We know that climate and morale issues erode our effectiveness and directly impact students. If we don't care, take care of our team, then our students don't receive our very best. With that in mind, we are crafting a multifaceted, comprehensive plan focused on engagement, wellness, and appreciation. Union leaders were invited to participate in this work on September 13th to share ideas during our next meeting after collaborating with their membership. Next slide. The efficiency report recommends the development and implementation of a written strategic communication plan that enhances transparency. The new director of communication, Boende Onijala, is currently leading an in-depth review of our methods and will assess effectiveness in collaboration with the communications team. These data will be used to create a plan that addresses identified gaps. The plan, of course, will be shared with the board in October. Next slide. With some of the work outlined in the report is tied to budget cycles and hinges on position management. We have heard loud and clear that there are needs that there are needs to be met right now. Wherever we can, we are engaging in interim problem solving steps. So thank you school leaders, staff and families for sharing your concerns around transportation, technology and payroll. To address the transportation shortage, we will continue to conduct job fairs and explore adjustments to compensation to better attract staff. In the interest of transparency, we are creating a data dashboard to track and report on-time arrivals and communication. In response to technology needs, we will collect data on our ticket completion response time and rate. Principals, principals, thank you for sharing the need for a top 10 report focus cheat sheet. In addition to develop, developing this cheat sheet, we will provide optional training sessions during the second week of October. We will also, through position management, explore additional centralized technology support for schools. And in the area of payroll, we will monitor customer service response rates and explore new technologies and contracted service to improve efficiencies. Next slide, please. As we are all well aware, there is a staffing shortage across the nation. We continue to host job fairs to attract high quality applicants in order to increase retention, remain competitive and ensure alignment with the blueprint for Maryland's future. We will conduct a salary study for all unions. We will also explore incentives such as a no cost fingerprinting and signing bonuses to remove barriers for our support professionals. In the area of certification, we will create dedicated opportunities to address staff concerns and report our progress. Next slide. As excited as we have been to welcome students back to in-person learning, we acknowledge that this represents a period of adjustment. For an example, our current ninth graders were last in full-time school in seventh grade. While the virtual learning environment from last year makes it difficult to accurately compare year-to-year -year data, we know that 
there's concern about some student behavior. So that we all have a clear picture, we will collect and report data and explore community partnerships to support our students and families. We will also maintain our focus on social emotional learning in schools. Many members of Team BCPS have helped to support contact tracing efforts. In many cases, our nurses have led this charge and we appreciate them. In order to support all involved, including nurses, health assistants, clerical and other staff, we are continuing to provide additional compensation to staff for overtime. We're also hiring contract nurses and or contact tracers to support schools. So thank you principals and assistant principals for being the front facing representatives of Team BCPS for your communities. We know that the ongoing pandemic has created new challenges for you and your teams as you deliver messages and ensure the safety of all of our students. We definitely appreciate your leadership. Next slide. While we engage in our balance and study approach to respond to the efficiency review, our day-to-day -day work continues. Teaching and learning, data literacy, social emotional wellness, and the standard of excellence remain our focus areas. As we meet with stakeholders, we will tend to do the right now while we address the future. As a system, we have everything that we need to make this work. Everyone has a seat at the table. It is important that we do not, do not become distracted or divided by the noise. Thank you so much for your continued support and engagement in this work. Thank you, Dr. Williams. Are there any questions from board members for discussion? Yes, Ms. Mack. Thank you, Dr. Williams, for that update. Um, one of the big issues that Public Works pointed out was the staffing deficiencies in HR. I don't have your slide, so I, I, but I, did you speak to that at all about filling some of those positions in HR in the early parts of your plan? So my plan talked about having our groups, our stakeholder groups to look at every recommendation and finding and make some recommendations. And if you're referring to that chapter, there were several findings and recommendations regarding HR, um, particularly around the technology. So I talked about technology as well as other ways to support what's happening in HR. But I, I remember reading that that was the one area, there, there were a lot of areas where they recommended cuts, but I believe HR, I believe the report said we're woefully understaffed. So that will be part of the conversation also. So that will be a part of my update. And will the job descriptions that include required and desired skills for each of the eight report positions reporting directly to you be provided to the board as you advertise those jobs or fill those jobs? I don't see why not. Okay, thank you. And then I, I didn't have the slide. Was there a division of IT as one of the di yes. eight so direct Yes, so one of reports? the slides reference Believe it's slide seven. So, chief information officer. Oh, that okay. I we don't we don't have them, so I I didn't see that. Thank you. Okay, oh, those are my questions. Was it not posted? Was it not posted on the screen? Where? Oh, we will be happy to share that. Okay, no thank problem. you. Yeah. Okay, that's that's what I'm looking for. I had your undivided attention since you, you didn't did. have it. You did? Yes. Okay, I'm, I see it now, but I couldn't remember seeing it, so thank you. Mr. McMillian? Dr. Williams, I understand the ship has sailed on the efficiency review. Uh, however, did you and your staff forward a rebuttal to Dr. Cox based upon the outcomes of her organizational review? I don't know if I would classify as a rebuttal. We were given the opportunity to respond um, based on some of their recommendations and findings. Um, and if you go and look at the 759 pages, you'll see some of my responses are in there, maybe questioning something or seeking clarity. But at this point, they have completed their work. It is now upon us to take that and make this our work. 
Okay. Secondly, considering the internal audit department falls under the Board of Education's umbrella of responsibilities, is that department included in your reorganization? That department is included in the recommendations from Public Works LLC. Specifically under what, what category? I believe it's on the finance, I want to say chapter four, but we can give, I don't have the, the document in front of me to give you the exact Okay, chapter. and lastly, will the internal audit department receive an invitation to join a division work group? Oh, absolutely. Thank you. Yes. Thank you. And I just want to clarify, although, Ms. although Mr. McMillian didn't say this, this was an efficiency review and not an audit. Mm -hmm. I think Ms. Barr would appreciate me clarifying the difference. Okay. Any additional questions? None? Okay. Thank you, Dr. Williams. The next item on the agenda is the report on the 2021 through 2022 student performance report. And for that, I call on Dr. Williams and Dr. Wheatley Phillips. Good evening. You can hear it? Okay, sorry. Good evening, Board Chair Scott, Vice Chair Hen, Superintendent Dr. Williams, and members of the board and the community. Tonight, we will present our annual student performance report as aligned with the Compass, our strategic plan. Joining me tonight are Mr. Kevin Connolly, Executive Director, Performance Management and Assessment, and Dr. Eric Minus, Executive Director, Research and Data Analytics. Next slide, please. The Compass commitments establish targets and goals for continuous growth and achievement. The metrics and targets for our learning accountability and results Compass commitments are predictive of college perseverance, college readiness, and present benchmarks for access, opportunity, the, and the achievement across school levels. The Compass allows us to focus on and prioritize the needs of students. When developing the strategic plan, it was essential to keep the end in mind which is to graduate students who are ready for college, career, the military, and trade. From this goal, critical benchmarks and transition points were identified to provide insight as to whether students are on predictive pathways for college and career readiness. As you can see, we set forth a trajectory that would, at critical junctures, allow us to assess our progress towards students being ready for college, career, or service. On the next slide, Mr. Connolly will provide an overview of the MSDE early fall assessments. Next slide, please. Thank you, Dr. Wheatley Phillip. In order to meet federal testing mandates, the U.S. Department of Education allowed MSDE to postpone the 2021 state assessments until the fall of 2021. Maryland schools will be administering shortened versions of the 2021 state assessments in ELA, math, and science this fall referred to as the Maryland Early Fall Assessments. Students will take the test associated with the grade level or course they were enrolled in during the 2021 school year. We anticipate that results will be available regarding student proficiency by the end of October and standards-based reporting by December. Due to changes in how test items are scored for the Early Fall Assessment, as well as a lack of common scale across assessment forms, we believe the value of the performance data reported is to inform standards-based achievement at the system level and potentially provide insight into course content and curriculum. Next slide, please. MSDE will resume normal administration times for all state assessments beginning in December. In addition to these assessments, Team BCPS uses standards-based formative and summative assessments, such as teacher-created tests and curriculum-based assessments, also known as CBAs, to monitor student learning and adjust instruction to meet the needs of students. Standards-based assessments are administered to students in kindergarten through grade 12 across content areas at regular intervals. Growth and achievement over time is measured through standards-based and norm-referenced assessments, such as MAP, 
PSAT, and AP. Additionally, CTE certification exams are used to understand student mastery compared to industry benchmarks or standards. Dr. Eric Minus will share with you information regarding the BCPS dashboard and student data. Next slide, please. Thank you, Mr. Conley, and good evening, everyone. As part of Dr. Williams and Team BCPS's commitment to transparency, the School Profile Dashboard has been publicly available to all stakeholders since March 2019 through our bcps.org website. The School Profile Dashboard, which is updated annually, provides a wealth of information about our schools, including academic achievement, climate, and demographic data, as well as more operational information, such as operating budget, building utilization, and the number of teachers. As a complement to the Highlights tab, there are three additional tabs that provide additional academic achievement data, including MAP for elementary or, and middle schools, the Maryland Comprehensive Assessment Program, or MCAP, for elementary, middle, and high schools, as well as PSAT and SAT data for high schools. The School Profile Dashboard is available along with the COVID Facilities Management Compass and Strategic Survey public dashboards available on our bcps.org website. Next slide, please. And so we are all excited to be back in our school buildings. And as we move forward in the 2021-2022 school year, it is important to have a baseline to use as a starting point in measuring student progress. Grounded in our metrics for the Compass, MAP assessments provide us with valuable growth and achievement information. The last MAP assessments given before the COVID-19 closures were completed in February of 2020. The table displays the percentage of students who scored at or above the 61st percentile, which is our compass metric, in grades K through five in math and reading. This information is based on students who took the test in February of 2020 and not current student enrollment. The information represented in the slide displays data prior to updates in curriculum, professional development in mathematics and ELA, and recommendations from the system improvement team. After the fall 2021 testing, we will share this information again based on this year's administration of MAP. It will be important to note that in the fall, kindergarten students do not participate in MAP as they do annually in the state mandated KRA assessment. NWEA resets MAP norms per industry standards every five years. All the data presented are based on the new 2020 NWEA norms for math and reading. The norm study was completed prior to COVID-19 and the norms were not adjusted following the COVID-19 closures. Mr. Connolly will now share with you additional information about student performance. Next slide, please. Thank you, Dr. Bidas. Um, for our students in grades six through eight who took the MAP assessments in February of 2020, 30.8% of those students scored at or above the 61st percentile in math, and 37.9% scored at or above the 61st percentile in reading. The data displayed is prior to updates in curriculum, professional development, and mathematics at ELA, and recommendations from the system improvement team. In December, we will provide achievement data for reading and mathematics for students in grades one through eight based on our fall 2021 MAP assessments. Next slide, please. Just as we are using MAP data to provide a baseline for our students in grades one through eight, we have identified end of course grades to gauge where our secondary students are in terms of being on track for graduation, since research has shown that course grades are an important predictor of graduation. Both English 10 and Algebra 1 courses are required for graduation and have an associated MCAP assessment. The course grades were completed prior to updates in grading and reporting implemented at the school level, curriculum, professional learning, and recommendations from the system improvement team. This slide displays the percentage of students earning an end of course grade of C or higher for the 2021 school year. On the far left in blue, 
you can see that 60.8% of students who took English 10 during the 2021 school year earned an end of course grade of C or higher. Since Algebra 1 can be taken in both middle school and high school, to complete the graduation requirement, two bars are presented. In the middle orange bar, you can see that 74.7% of 6th through 8th graders earned an end of course grade of C or higher in the 2021 school year, compared to 45.6% of students in grades 9 through 12. It is important to note that we as a system deliberately chose to set our baseline as the percentage of students earning a C or higher on these critical courses because we are committed to raising the bar for all students and preparing them for success in college, career, or service. Dr. Wheatley Phillip will share with you updates of our cross-divisional plans. Next slide, please. Thank you, Mr. Connolly. The Compass articulates our vision, purpose, and strategic actions to raise the bar, close gaps, and prepare all students for the future. Our commitment to continuous improvement rooted in board policy and Superintendent's Rule 3170 is operationalized across the system through school progress plans and office progress plans, which are all aligned with our strategic plan. Goals, metrics, and targets provide focused progress monitoring, school and office teams engage in a comprehensive needs assessment and root cause analyses to identify specific goals, design action steps to drive intentional improvement and engage in professional learning to promote success. Continuous improvement efforts, to function, continuous improvement efforts function to promote growth and equitable outcomes while preparing all students for college, career, and service. Professional learning is an integral component of our work and is embedded in our school progress plans and office progress plans. The teaching and learning team leads a focused effort to operationalize the teaching and learning framework throughout our school system's instructional programs, supports, and services. System-wide needs are researched by the system improvement team work groups who propose action plans to improve outcomes, while the instructional core team provides differentiated scaffolds of support to specific schools across the school system. To further support student growth and achievement, at the school and classroom levels, the ongoing assessment of learning is taking place before, during, and after instruction. And adjustments to support students are made accordingly. The analysis of these data ensure that real-time data are used to inform instruction. Next slide, please. Throughout the 21-22 school year, Team BCPS will continue to provide regular updates on how our students are progressing. Some of these upcoming reports include MAP for fall and winter and advanced placement to name a few. These reports are available on the BCPS key reports using the links that you see on this slide. New reports will be uploaded throughout the year as data become available. Next slide, please. As a team, we look forward to providing you with updates on systemic continuous improvement. And so our next steps include a focus on continuous improvement through using data to inform, implementation of the recommendations by the school improvement team work groups, continued collaborative supports to schools by the instructional core team, and the implementation of new curriculum initiatives in ELA and mathematics. We thank you for the opportunity to present this information. At this time, Dr. Williams will provide closing comments. Dr. Williams. Next slide, please. So this slide represents the overall plan to have regular updates to the Board of Education on several data points reflecting student achievement. Some of these reports and discussions may be appropriate during your committee meetings where they may be sufficient time to drill down or conduct a work session regarding a particular data point. In addition, the schedule needs to be fluid because of the availability of data points and the data analysis as we may need to compare ourselves to other school systems, the state average and national average. We have tentatively planned out these student achievement reports and updates to the board for this current school year. Also, I would like to bring to your attention that we align these reports and or updates to your board goals. 
clearly the reports on student achievement are aligned with the outcomes of focus area number one of the compass, our pathway to excellence, learning accountability, and results. You have additional goals associated with the other focus areas of our strategic plan, and these updates and reports are not reflected on this slide. In addition, there are other topics that you offered during the agenda setting. These goals and these suggested topics are all used during our agenda setting with the board leadership or the board leadership biweekly meetings. A passage from Data Quality Campaign's resource entitled, From Hammer to Flashlight, A Decade of Data in Education. That passage reads as follows. Data itself does not improve teaching and learning. Too often in education, data is seen as a hammer, a tool of accountability to ensure that targets are being met. While accountability is important, blame and shame often follow when results fall short. Shifting this paradigm and moving beyond accountability opens the door to a vast array of opportunity to use data as a flashlight, shining a light on what is working and fueling continuous improvement. The culture of education is, being, is beginning to embrace the true potential of data, not just to comply with requirements, but also to inform decisions and drive improvement. It was today that I sat with two of our principals and discussed the data-driven decision-making when developing a master's schedule, enrolling students in advanced honors GT or AP course, dual enrollment or our early college access program, and building support for students and staff. So thank you to Principal Emily Castor at Sparrows Point High School and Jennifer Granaris at Sparrows Point Middle School. Thank you to 7th District Elementary School Principal Heather Denmeyer for sharing her work with staff regarding curriculum implementation and planning and building the capacity of a fairly new teacher. Also to Principal um, principal of Pikesville Middle School, Kalisha Miller, Southwest Academy Principal April Franklin, Scotch Branch Elementary School Principal Lauren Tillman, and Golden Ring Middle School Principal Charlene Mole for their work with hiring male teachers and staff, and in some cases, hiring African American and Latino staff and, and teachers. And three of these schools are working on the MSDE, Maryland State Department of Education initi initiative entitled, Achieving Academic Excellence for Equity for Black Boys. Our principals' instructional leadership, the school culture and climate, and attention to the students are making a difference. Also, a big shout out to the wonderful students that I get to meet and interact during my visits at schools. These collaborative efforts will yield greater success and we added several structures to gather these practices of continuous improvement. You heard some of them today. The instructional core team, leadership development programs, the residency model, year-long professional development plan, our system improvement teams, data literacy, and our teaching and learning team. So thank you for this opportunity to share a few words. And I would like to thank all of our central office staff and all the work, but I have to thank draw the staff from the Division of Research, Accountability, and Assessment for their continued work and being the light for the system, offices, and schools. So we thank you, board. Thank you for this presentation. Thank you, staff. Thank you. Thank you very much. Any discussion or questions from board members? Yes, Ms. Rell? We can't hear you. Sorry. So there was a list here. It disappeared a second ago. Um, in that list of uh, presentations the board will get, I didn't see anything that looked like um, information on student achievement regarding special education, early identification, and assessment for services or, um, you know, how are we identifying kids early? And what are we doing? How many are we identifying? Who are we providing services to? That sort of thing. And I think it's great to know how many kids are succeeding, but I'd like to know what we're doing 
to help the kids who fall outside of those percentages to succeed in that early identification and a report on that or including that information in other reports would be great. So um, if I may respond, Ms. Rowe, sure. to that, our team is, is quite aware that we disaggregate the data. So we look at the data in a, a variety of lens, mm -hmm. and that is one of them. So whenever we look at a data, we disaggregate the data by race, by gender, and any services. And a part of the curriculum committee, I'm going to look to Dr. McComas for a little bit, that um, that specific topic, we're happy to either include that in a committee meeting or bring that to the full board. But I just want to just reiterate a point Everything we do is, uh, is somehow touching student achievement. Based on your goals, based on the, the work that we've done with retreats, based on the conversation with draw the available data points. And we've mapped out for a year in which we're trying to provide those regular updates to the board. And it's important that they are affiliated with your board goals mm -hmm. because you work real hard to align those go board goals to the strategic plan. So, like I said, this is not an exhaustive list. Okay. Um, there are several topics that you raised during this upcoming uh, agenda title about future meetings, and we will incorporate those ideas a part of the planning that happens biweekly with the board leadership. So I just wanted to make sure that the board knows um, we wanted to display, every time we talk about data, we want to show like that checklist we talked about these items, and so you can see that work is really happening and that we are, comp we are really talking about student achievement in a variety of ways, whether it's the big meeting, board meeting, or committee meetings, or other, other types of meetings for you to really know. And I really appreciate Draw doing that dashboard to be very clear about what data points we have and how we can make those points available to our public, so thank you. Okay, the only other question I had is, can you just unpack in layman terms, what is instructional core team collaborative support to schools? What does that look like? Sure. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> I yield to Dr. Williams. <laughs> Thank you so much for the question. You know, we had members of our um, Division of School Support and Achievement to join us tonight. And the work within the Instructional Core team really surrounds the work that they engage in as leaders in terms of identifying specific schools, identifying the needs that exist within the schools, and really developing specific plans to meet the needs of the leaders and the staff within those schools. So the Instructional Core team really brings together the best of what we offer in BCPS in terms of resources, in terms of materials, in terms of the best of the the best and brightest in terms of our minds to really identify schools that are most critical or at a critical juncture and developing a plan to really support them so so uh, if I may add to that so there's the residency model where our teachers are working with other our resource teachers are working with other teachers to build their capacity the instructional court is building the, the capacity of the school leaders that may be the principal assistant principal in their instructional team that they work with our instructional team, their representatives across the district, curriculum, school side, draw, safety, climate, et cetera. So it's really building the capacity. The instructional core team is building the capacity within the building to sustain progress. The, the, so that's the major difference. And I provided an update to the board. I want to say when we created that, when I first came, I'll be happy to provide another update to the board as a reference about the instructional core team. Thank you, additional questions? Oh, sorry, I'll go around. Um, Ms. Mack and then Dr. Hager. Thank you very much, all three of you, for the information. I really appreciate it. And Dr. Williams, thank you for providing the updates to the board. I, I like that visual so that we can track what's going on. Um, Dr. Wheatley Phillip, in non-COVID times, did we show map for winter, spring, and fall? Or do we only show map for winter? We actually display map after each, um, each administration of it. Oh, so you downstairs. just included winter in here as an illustration? Uh, as, uh, I guess as the data comes, then you would present. That is correct. They, they provided the available data. Remember that we closed in March. So the available data was the map of the winter of 2020. So what, so the typical,
presentation right, is the end of the I'm year, right. but they have to say this is the available, the latest data that we have on that. And when, let's say, we get back to normal quickly, will we show all three on the data dashboard or will we only show the most current? like fall, winter, and spring. I, I, I think that's something we can take back and discuss as the team, but I, I, I just want to put a pin in what Ms. Max said. Back to normal, we have to understand there's a new normal. And so as we are building, mm -hmm. as we are recovering, as we're healing, again, we'll provide as much data as possible. Um, but to your point, I think we can have a discussion about how to display the three administrations of MAP. We want to provide the update to the board because that's affiliated with one of your goals. How are our students doing with MAP R and MAP M? My other question, um, and I'm not sure if you're the right person. So when parents look at report cards, I'll say specifically for math and reading, is there any indication on the report card where the student is relative to expect, expected grade level achievement? In other words, does the report card indicate that Lisa has made great improvements in this quarter or this year, however, she has still not, she has not yet achieved grade level proficiency? Do we tell both, we, do we show the growth and the proficiency on our report cards at the student level? That specific question I'm not sure about as it relates to report cards. I, I think what you're describing is along the lines of comments that really provide greater context to just the written score, the, the numerical score that you see there. And so I think we would have to um, circle back and provide additional clarity regarding that because report card comments provide more. They tell more of the story. And I don't know at this point if that's included as part of the reporting process, but we can certainly get back to you um, based on Dr. Williams' directive in terms of that question. Thank you. And then my last question, which I'm going to try to ask using a flashlight, is on your slide eight, you show based on a, gr uh, a grade of a C or a better, that 60.8% of students show proficiency in ELA 10. But the last MSDE update showed that 33.6% of our 10th graders were proficient in ELA 10. Can you help me understand the discrepancy? So I believe we're talking about MCAP, which are state assessments, and what we're listed here are course grades. So I'm gonna defer to Mr. Connolly because in terms of assessments, he really has a strong wheelhouse, but I think we're looking at almost apples and oranges there because one is talking about MSCE, MCAP in terms of a state assessment, the other one is course grades. Mr. Can Connolly? Can I just add something? The reason mm -hmm. I asked the question is because, and I'm sorry, I don't know which one of you said it, we, we look at this data to make sure that our students are ready for college, career, army, or whatever. When, when, there, when there's that big of a discrepancy, I just wonder if our tests are showing whether or not our children are ready. Thank you. Uh, the <coughs> data that we're referencing with MCAP is two years old. You, we did not provide MCAP assessment last spring or, right. the, or the previous spring. So we're comparing different cohorts of, of students. We also have ELA 10 is 10th graders who completed the 10th grade course from 1819 when you're looking at MCAP data. This data represents students who participated in ELA 10 from 9th through 12th grade um, you know, in, the, in the year 2021. So there were different groups of kids that we're comparing. So the data doesn't you know, match the, to the sets. They're different cohorts of students. But that's a 30 point difference. I understand what you're saying, but I also look at data over a five and six year period, and we have, we have been in the 30% proficiency. So I understand, I know we've been through a pandemic and kids have been in virtual learning, but I, I'm surprised at the difference is what I'll, I'll leave it at. So if I may comment regarding that. Thanks. What's coming to the board is the report on college and, and career readiness and that will give you a little bit additional information. But I would say, um, as we look at a particular data point, you have to look, I would recommend the board look at multiple data points regarding a cohort of students, and then looking at how they're progressing. The MAP-10 is a snapshot of what our students have done 
in 10th grade, but it doesn't tell the full story as they progress to 11th grade and 12th grade. And so hence why we have the list of all the updates that we just want to constantly remind the board looking at mul multiple data points and looking at what we're doing. And I think the report around the college and career readiness, the CTE and the college credit may build a better understanding about data points, multiple data points. Yep. Thank you. Dr. Hager. Yes, um, thank you. Also, the executive summary in particular is really helpful, so thank you for that. Um, the choice to present a C or better, is that because we don't have standardized tests? Is that why we chose to look at grades in those courses last year? Is that, was that the rationale for that? So we're looking at another, uh, excuse me, <coughs> we're looking at another data set um, that is closest to student teaching and learning mm -hmm. for outcomes. You know, prior to that, we have to go back to 1819 to look at standardized mm -hmm. um, norm referenced or criterion referenced assessment through MCAP. No, and I, and I totally understand. And I, I, again, thank you for your transparency with the C or better as using that threshold. Um, will you then provide that same data for the prior year and for this current year so that we can have an apples to apples comparison? Because it doesn't seem like this has been used in the past. So here's the challenge with the prior year data. We offered pass fail. Yes, I so get So we it. have yep. a okay. whole set of data that right. isn't comparable. About that. So yeah. we have a smaller sample size, but we certainly have moving forward um, a baseline now that we can compare to, mm -hmm. which is similar to what we're doing with the map data. Okay. You know, we had to go back to 2020 of winter to establish a baseline. We'll have a new baseline once we complete fall that we'll report in December, and then we'll have a growth report that'll come out in March, looking at fall to winter in comparisons of grades one through eight. Okay, and, and honestly, at least one pre-pandemic comparison year would be really helpful. So even if it was two years prior, but I completely forgot about the pass-fail situation. Mm -hmm. um, and then it, it's, the data shows that almost 40% of kids got a D or an E. What happens if you get a D or an E? Do you repeat or do you, are you as a D passing? So a, a D is passing. Um, so students can pass the course with a D. Um, if, if it's a graduation course, such as the ones we selected here for English Cheddar Algebra 1, students would also have to pass the associated assessment. Um, because of the global pandemic, the state has waived you know, uh, passing of assessments, which requires a 725 for graduation, but a 750 for proficiency for the last two cohorts of exiting uh, grade 12 students. Interesting, thank you. And just to add to that, you're correct when you're saying D is a passing, you will earn a credit, hence why we looked at a C or higher. Thank you. It looks like we have a question from um, Ms. Jost, who's on the phone. Ms. Jost, are you there? If you're there, you're on mute. We cannot hear you. Can you hear me now? We can hear you now. We could hear you. Okay, we can come back to Ms. Jost. Did anyone else have any questions? Yes, Ms. Rowe. Um, I would just like to know, so we had Hello? MCAP or PARC. Oh. Like, so if you got a four or a five on a PARC, do we know what percentage of students taking the MAP test equal that level? Like what percentile do you have to be? Do we correlate the percentiles with MAP with the num numbering score on the state assessment? So I think I'll ask Mr. Connolly to share, but the, the MAP really are norm reference tests. So you look at a common group of students within the same range um, to really use the, the MAP data. MCAP is looking at standard space. So it's almost two different things in terms of a group of students um, that represent um, I don't want to say a cohort, but the norm reference in terms of being within the same age, within the same grade, whereas MCAP is looking at a particular standard at which they're performing. So I think they're a little bit different. So when right? we were um, <laughs> lifting up the strategic plan, one of the um, discussions we had with Dr. Williams as a group was really about establishing a high bar. And prior to the, the launching of the Compass, that bar was at the 50th percentile. When we developed our trajectory and started looking at cohorts of kids and back mapping it so that we're comparing MCAP performance with students who were at or above the 50th percentile, what we found was that that threshold was too low. Students were correlating to roughly a proficiency level between a two and a three. 
So when we raised up to high average, which was that 61st percentile, we are now looking at predicting students who are approaching standards or better. So that was the difference and why that was that shift happened and how we raised the bar. I'm sorry, say that again? So then like threes and fours? Well, approaching or greater. Okay. Thank you. Ms. Jost, are you back with us? Yes, can you hear me now? We certainly can. Yes, please go ahead. All right. Thank you. Dr. Williams, um, thank you for this presentation. And I get your point about data as a flashlight and not a hammer, but the schools that you're flashlighted, we've already been aware of these schools for a long time. The Featherbed Lane Elementary School, Deep Creek Elementary School, Colgate, Dundalk, Riverview, the list goes on. What specific, now that the light's out there, what specific action items is being taken? Because that should be the core of our um, goal as a board is what, what is being done to specifically move these schools up to where they are performing as well as some of our better performing schools. And these are some of our most marginalized, um, impoverished children. So for me, I wanted to hear something specific. What is being done and what are the metrics that's going to be used to um, measure that and see if there's improvements? Are we going to be taking things from our some of our high-performing schools? What, what are we doing right over there and what could we implement here? And sometimes not the same um, action might not be applicable, but I did not specifically hear anything in terms of action items. If you could, you know, explain that to me. Thank you. Well, I think, um, you know, I, I could spend the whole evening responding to that because there's several points. Um, I think the first big point is updating our strategic plan and having a metric or having metrics mm -hmm. to determine where schools fall uh, in, in terms of da several data points. And then the schools working with their school leadership, their parent leadership, uh, and high schools working with and middle schools working with their councils to look at what they can do to really support student achievement in that in that building. And so uh, you heard a little bit today when we looked at opening of school to highlight what's happening at Scotch Branch. Um, but to, in all honesty is really developing that roadmap, which the community superintendents talked about their school progress plan. So where we're trying to, we have to look at each school, look at where they are, and, and map out how we want to get to these data points or these targets within a multi-year plan. Um, and so I, we did not give that specific information, but we're, we're happy to always incorporate what this will look like at the schoolhouse. So all these data points, we can give the analysis of what, what we look like with other systems across the state, across the nation, if those data points are available. But then uh, what I hear, hear you say, then what does that look like with implementation? There will be 175, soon 176 different plans because every school is differently. You said something that's quite interesting. Uh, looking at resources, a lot of it is time. As I shared um, with the conversation I had with Principal Gennaris, that whole time in which she spends with her staff to plan and to do a curriculum study and to understand what's in the curriculum and then plan accordingly. That is kind of foundational 101. Then what's happening in the classroom with the implementation and assessment. So uh, I think what we can do when we do our reports, we can talk about what does that look like or feel like in the classroom through the lens of a, of a student, through the lens of the staff, and through the lens of a parent. Um, and I think you have a lot of data points that we can do that through those three lenses. Thank you. Yes, Ms. Pastor. Uh, I think that uh, you mentioned committees. I do think that some of the questions that are being asked can be impacted by the work that we do in our committee. I'm hearing a lot of things like the last couple of questions that will certainly come up in the curriculum committee. And I think uh, about Ms. Mack, who has asked particularly about um, professional development and how we're going to do all of the things that need to be done in terms of that. 
but certainly with Ms. Tillman's comments and the things we've heard tonight in committee, we can see how we um, massage or maneuver even some of the, the resources that are being presented so that they can, going back to Ms. Joe's question, they can be directly aligned with what school, particular schools are doing so that, uh, and I hope I'm, Ms. Mack, particularly to you that I'm making sense that instead of it looking like we're just getting materials just willy-nilly fashion, that we in fact can attach them to the work that's being done at some of our more specific schools just as Ms. Tillman designed and laid out tonight. Mm -hmm. And I think as you continue on with your plan, we'll see how it's almost going to be like a puzzle and some of these things are going to be dropped in. So our committees are going to be very, very important in terms of addressing some of those. Do you think I'm on track? Or I, I think you are. Yeah. I, I also would look to the team about our executive summaries. There may be something that we can incorporate that. Um, but again, to your point, the committees are designed where you can kind of drill down and, and really spend some time in understanding. But this is good feedback, so thank you. Thank you. Any additional comments or questions? Yes, Ms. Colsey. Thank you, Madam Chair. Um, I just want to thank you, Dr. Williams and uh, Dr. Monique Lee, Lee Phillips and your team. Um, that was uh, really very helpful to understand that. And we, and we know there's so many difficulties with what's happened in the pandemic and the changes that it's brought in terms of waivers of assessments and, and impacting the grading and all of that. Um, I did want to go to, and I thank you, Dr. Williams, for the timeline of uh, when the reports are coming out. And I wanted to also ask about um, the report on attendance is in February 2022. And we've talked about the board's role and you know, over a number of meetings. So in the reports that are coming, will there be recommendations to the board in terms of modifying policy um, in, to align with any superintendent rule changes you might want to make? And then of course, uh, resources or programs um, that the board would support, whether it's through budgeting or uh, supporting specific programs? So uh, I'm not able to answer that question. It, it's, it's would, it would be more than likely looking at what we're doing with the, with the rule, the implementation, and, or it may be just good professional learning or a good opportunity to showcase what we're doing for certain schools. And so there may be that desire, and I'll work through the appropriate channel if that's, if that's the case, if it's about policy. Um, but the, the point is to really show what we look like, be transparent, and then this last conversation, what that may look like at certain schools or what, we can, what we're doing through the lens of the student, through the lens of the staff and the parent. Thank you, because to dovetail with that, um, the report on the grading and um, implementation is not until June. And what I wondered about is if you or staff could um, describe the timeline issues in terms of any changes that would need to be made to policy um, or even superintendent's rules related to agreements with our bargaining units of when they need to understand changes that are coming. Well, this, based on my recommendation to the board, and you approve the, the, an update about the implementation of grading and reporting. Um, if we find after this first year that that may not be the most appropriate time, then we will make some recommendation. But since we've, it's my understanding, have not had this type of presentation about the implementation of grading and reporting and collecting that feedback, uh, I'm not sure if we do need to move that time. But again, it's about implementation of, the, of, the, of our manual, and that's the kind of feedback we want to get. And if there's some changes, uh, we will work with the uh, respective office and our stakeholders to try to get some changes if it's going to impact the upcoming school year. Okay, thank you. Um, because one of, I, I really liked how you were talking about it being a predictor. Excuse me? Thank you. And I also liked um, how you put that it was prior to the updates in grading, reporting, curriculum, professional development, and, and the recommendations in SIT, and pointing out that 
those are changes that you're making that the board is um, with you on with the board goals and um, approving the, the compass. So it, it's great to see that those are gonna be the future impactors on our student achievement. So I appreciate that. Thank you. Any other questions? No. Okay, thank you all very much for the presentation. Wonderful. <laughs> okay, so the next item on the agenda are informational item or information items, which include the report on summer learning programs, revised superintendent's rule 3800 4104 5130. 5210 and 5600 and the Southeast Area Education Advisory Council meeting minutes of June 14th, 2021. The next item on the agenda is board committee updates and agenda items for future board meetings and we will start with Ms. Rowe. So I would really just, it's an agenda item like more information about how we advertise our birth to five programs to families with birth to five children because those early assessment tools are very important and there are many times I talk to people in the community who don't know that those services even exist and I think that if we could um, have some collaboration with pediatricians or daycare centers or people to know that birth to five exists that that could be helpful. Thank you. Next is Ms. Causey. Um, thank you. I have provided a number of inputs before, so, um, and I appreciate the performance um, updates being provided to us by Dr. Williams, so I'm not gonna add anything at this time. Thank you. Next we have um, Ms. Mack. I would just like to support Ms. Rowe's request for birth to five information as I get to see it in action every week. And I see the difference that it's making in a child's life. And I think it would be beneficial for the full board to understand it and for our constituents to know what's out there because it is a critical time in a child's life where we have an opportunity to make a change. So if we could get some information on that, it would be helpful. Thank you. Next we have Mr. McMillian. Uh, as chair of the Internal Audit Committee, we meet on Tuesday, October 19th from 4.30 to 6 o'clock virtually. I do not have any agenda items. Thank you. Thank you. Next is Ms. Jones. Thank you, Ms. Scott. Um, the Building and Contracts Committee will be meeting on Monday, October 11th at 5 p.m., um, the day before the board meeting. Uh, I also want to remind board members that the Summit Park Elementary School preliminary design presentation will also be presented prior to the Building and Contracts Committee on uh, Monday uh, at 4.30. Uh, and I have no items to add. Thank you. Good night. Thank you. Next is Ms. Hen. Thank you. Um, the Budget Committee will be meeting on Wednesday, October 20th. We last met on the 22nd of this month, um, had a very um, useful and productive meeting. Would like to thank Mr. Ferris and Mr. Cantliff um, for the presentation on state reporting. Um, it was a good first step towards the committee's goal of benchmarking um, BCPS's um, expenditures against other school systems. Had a very helpful um, overview of some state reporting and the budget committee discussed for its next meeting, um, beginning a discussion of the budgeting process and timeline. So that will be um, discussed for adding to the agenda for our next meeting on October 20th. And I have no agenda items to add at this time, Madam Chair, thank you. Thank you, next is Mr. Thomas. Thank you. I just wanna thank uh, my fellow members of the Policy Review Committee for a great first PRC meeting uh, last Monday. I also um, just want to say that I'm excited to be serving my, as my as the vice chair of the legislative committee with our first meeting coming up uh, with Ms. Pastor uh, soon and Ms. Hen. And uh, I don't know if this is the proper way to uh, request this, but at the next policy review committee meeting, I would like us to uh, review the policy that Mr. Duke presented earlier when discussing the calendar. Thank you. Thank you. Next is Mr. Offerman. 
Uh, I'd like to piggyback on wh what several of members have said before. I would like to see a report on, our, on, on what we do with all of our K-5, particular interest in terms of trying to uh, increase the number of students who are able to qualify for, for the, uh, for the pre-K program. I have nothing else. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Offerman. Next, we have Ms. Pastor. Okay. Um, that was, she's curriculum. Who's the vice chair of the curriculum committee? Is there any update? Me. Uh, I'm the vice chair, and I don't, I don't have the date in front of me, but okay. we're going to meet in. I, we're going to meet it. I didn't in, know if there was any October. update or anything. No, okay. nothing, nothing new. <laughs> Thank you. All right. Dr. Hager. Um, I, I didn't have any additional agenda items, but I echo the zero to five conversation. It's a really important one. So that's it. Thank you. Uh, Mr. Kuhn. Well, thank you, Ms. Scott. Um, I would offer up um, an item uh, to discuss regarding currently where we stand with uh, various school construction projects, basically a school construction update. And that's all. Thank you. Thank you. And I will go and I'll um, give an update. We had our um, equity, our next uh, equity meeting will be um, October 21st. And our next PRC meeting will be October 18th. And at our equity meeting, let's see, I had that up here. Um, we just basically looked at um, a, a Board of Education Equity Committee resolution and an accompanying graphic, which we are working on, um, the establishment of an equi equity advisory council, and also looking at data from gifted and talented, what barriers there are, the changing data, and looking at what our desired end will be. So I think we're doing some really um, uh, exciting things on that on that new committee. And, <laughs> and uh, it was uh, <laughs> Mr. Thomas's first meeting with us, so. Um, so welcome. And also we had PRC where we went over various policies, um, board officers, chair, vice chair duties, and um, a whole lot of different other policies, financial disclosures, and um, we also went over uh, board officers' elections and terms, and so that will come up later. And so I um, don't have any updates or anything else to add. Okay. And... The last item on the agenda is announcements. The board's next meeting will be held on Tuesday, October 12th at 6.30 p.m. The public hearing on the proposed 2022 to 2023 school calendar will be held during the public comment portion of this meeting. Information on how to register to speak will be on the board's website under participation by the public. As always, the board will welcome or welcomes written testimony, which can be sent to the BOE at bcps.org. So we thank you for joining us tonight, and the meeting is now adjourned. <laughs>